So, man. Uh, ah. So this. All right, yeah. I'm stopping it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fans in Motion podcast, the only podcast that you didn't know you needed. I say to my friends waiting for the show, feeling all right, every day looking like a Saturday night. Got the wheels to the road. I'm along for the ride. I need a long, tall Sally to keep me up all night. Say hello, Josh. That sounds really good. Well rehearsed. <laughs> it does. It sounds like knock, knock, never stop. Brent, what's going on in your world? I'm just um, having vuja day. There you go. I feel vuja like this day has never is the opposite before. of deja vu. Yeah, I feel like this shit's never happened before. So here we are. Uh, we're the next episode. We are introducing this one here. This episode is about um, we interviewed Tristan Avakian. Is that correct, Josh? Am I saying his name right? Tristan Avakian. Tristan Avakian. Look at that logo. Jeez. Yes. There you go. Look how. Look at those skills. Um. Yeah, Trist, Tristan is currently part of the Ultimate Queen Experience, which is Queen Tribute Band with Mark Martell. He yes. was in the official Queen Tribute Band before that, that uh, Brian May and Roger Taylor put together themselves. And he was in an early incarnation of Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And he was a ranger on reserve. He subbed for Joel Hoekstra for a couple years, I think 2010 and 2011, maybe 2011, 2012. You'll find that in the uh, interview. <coughs> so, yes, we basically talked to him for a good amount of time about his career. Very interesting life and career growing up. Not only yeah. in New York City, but L.A. and coming up through that scene. And, yeah, we talk about a lot of stuff, a lot of good Night Ranger stories. We talk about some unwritten rules while, you know, performing with bands that you're subbing with. Uh, so, yeah, it's a lot of good stuff. And uh, you'll really... Unless Les Nesman would have been happy because we talk about farming. <laughs> yeah, we get to uh, yeah. even uh, doing some uh, some farming questions. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if, and if you get a chance, <clears throat> we we talk about this. He has a a CD that he put out. Kind of a uh, an artist name that he records under is As Waters. It's a really good disc. You can go to his website, and for 20 bucks flat rate, you can get the CD, and that includes shipping, and it's worldwide shipping. He kind of just put on there. Yeah. He goes, "Hey, I hate to do math. Just twenty bucks, I'll mail it anywhere." Uh, but it is a really, really, really. I I, I say this again on the the uh, interview, and we did this interview a few weeks back. Uh, but I've now gotten my disc and have listened to it even more through my you know stereo system. Very good album. It's not, it's a dark, moody type record, but very good lyrics. I was just very much surprised. I highly recommend just going to his site and you can, you know, listen to some of the tracks on his website. But, uh, uh, what is his website? Do you I know? I think if you just try type in Tristan Avakian as Waters, it'll come up. Um, and I'll post it in one of the links or, or something at the YouTube page and on the page. But yeah, I mean, I, I highly recommend it. Go check it out. And he sent Avakian, A V A K I A N, just how it sounds. And um, so uh, he sent us, and I bought one, and he threw in an extra copy for us to give away. So here it is, and it's autographed. And I don't know, we'll nice. do some uh, contest to where. Um, if you, I'll keep it open for a week after the release of this po uh, podcast on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, hit subscribe and leave a comment of what you enjoyed about the interview, 
that will automatically enter you into whatever little drawing I do. And a few episodes. Under this episode. Under this episode. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, and my disclaimer is I can change the rules anytime I fucking want. <laughs> uh, so, he does. Uh, but yes, under this episode, just subs- hit, you know, click subscribe. And just something you found interesting about the interview, I'll automatically uh, enter you into the contest. We'll leave it open for a, one week after the release of the YouTube video. And we will announce the winner a few uh, few episodes down the road, and you will get this autographed Tristan Avakian As Waters CD. And, and real quick, the As Waters, for those that are just listening, it's as it sounds. It's A-S, as Waters, W A T E R S, yep. as waters. It's not a funny spelling or anything. It's nope. just as waters. It's very good. Uh, we talk about it on during the interview, and I just can't stress enough how really good <laughs> the CD is. I, like I said, when I I listened to it, you know, I had a digital copy. So I think when you buy it, you get a digital copy. He'll email you a digital copy, then you, they'll, he'll mail you the CD. And I had the digital copy. Then when I got the d- disc, I actually put it in my my system, I was just blown away on how really good it was. So there's good music out there. So enjoy the interview yeah. with Tristan and a great career, yeah. and you get to hear some great Night Ranger stories. And but you you know also the the disc is great. So yeah, good stuff coming up. Yeah, brought to you like, by like fans we talk Ocean. about all the time with these interviews. You know, a lot of these guys. Some of you you don't know their names, but. They are in the industry. They do have a tie to Night Ranger, obviously. It's why we interview them. But you're, there's some great stories that you would never hear in your lifetime if mm-hmm. you just don't take the time. So those of you that are, you know, that are already listening, spread the word. Tell someone you don't know. Tell some stranger walking down the street, hey, listen to this podcast. Definitely. So, uh, so last week's episode was the Midnight Madness vinyl episode, which was uh, a deep, deep dive on the vinyl and. The uh, the dead wax. I saw some comments. Uh, <laughs> you and Josh was Josh was schooling some people on the internet. Just the questions. What have you got feedback wise, Josh, on this one? Well, I mean, I, I the episode did really well, which always amazes me when we do the vinyl because you think it's a really small. Me too. Uh, yeah, but it 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 did great, and you know, it, it's a, when we when we rank stuff, we also look at views which you can see, everybody can see, but we also look at minutes watched. And some things can get a lot of views if someone just clicks on it and they watch for five seconds and they click off. Well, that's a view, but was it really worth it? Well, we can see how many minutes are watched, and the minutes watched were right up there as well. Uh, so it was a really good re, uh, received episodes. We talked about the Midnight Madness colored vinyl that was just released. And that's kind of what we obviously coordinated this episode with. But, uh, yeah, a lot of feedback. And it's the Midnight Madness one is probably the easiest to follow. When we get to do a Seven Wishes, now you're talking about different labels where they go from the rainbow to the camel label. So Midnight Madness is a good one just to kind of get familiar with pressing plants and just all that lingo and how things work. So. Yeah, I was impressed. I mean, again, I don't, I'm not a collector to any degree. Um, but it's fascinating when Josh was breaking down how you look in the dead wax and you can see the initials and the, I'll say logo that people put in, like the flower. Mm. And that stuff, I'm sure Brent is well aware of that stuff, but just stuff I never paid attention to. Well, remember I just, when we were kids, I used, I used to show you Pyromania, and on one side it said, if you're going to be a bear, you flip it over, it said, be a grizzly. I don't remember that, but you I'm sure you that? showed it to me. Nah, oh, man. What I'm what I'm impressed with is Andy learned what dead wax meant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and dead wax for those that don't know Just is recently is the yeah. you know when you got a vinyl record and you you know you got the grooves where you got song one two three four and five. There's a space between the last song and the label where there is just nothing. And if you look, there's little icons and initials. And they do tell a little bit of a story. Uh, Midnight Madness is was mastered by Alan Zent mastering by Brian Gardner. 
So you'll see on there the some of them have in real nice print mastered by Alan Zent yeah. mastering, but then some of them only have the A Z, which is Alan Zent. And then if you look, there's like a flower, and that is Brian Gardner's symbol. And it gets even deeper. I think maybe Brian Gardner, Alan Zent, sometimes has like little seagulls, like little, you know, how you would just draw like the little line of a bird, yeah. you know, in the background of a picture you're drawing. And and then there's some records where people really get, they dig deep into it, and I am not there. But I know even in the KISS discussions, they can get mastered by different, Mm -hmm. different individuals and there's some that you know you will have a let's say a copy of a lot two copies of alive both a different mastering and there's some people who will say that this mastering by this individual is superior to the other mass uh, mastering and you can go and find websites <coughs> where they will break down just every album a grateful dead album and say, okay, this album is produced or mastered by. You can find three masterings, and they'll tell you, okay, this version, you know, the the bass is a little bit buried, or in this version, the sounds a little bit brighter, and you can basically go by the same record and get different sounds based off who's the mastering. Now, as far as I know, Alan Zent did all the the Midnight Madness, so there shouldn't be a big degree in quality there but yeah you really want to go down that nerd hole uh that's <laughs> yeah, where for you some go. reason our our most viewed episodes are these deep dives that i just i, I josh and i in a, in a private mm -hmm. conversation were talking i was like these are the ones that i figured would have 10 views and they just seem to have the most well just just type in like vinyl dead wax on youtube and there are podcasts that just go into dead wax and and you if you guys know me i don't really listen to a lot of podcasts so i've went to them and listened to five minutes you know months ago yeah. but i know they exist and yeah what i'm telling you is 101 stuff you could probably go in there and dig deeper and yep. uh i just know if alan zentz actually mastered it it's it's something besides just the az but it, brian gardner is the one that did this so yeah, dig out your your Midnight Madness record. To figure, go back to the episode, figure out what pressing you have, and then realize there's about probably seven more U.S. pressings that you need, and then you got to start with the overseas ones. Now, here here's a little trivia for Andy oh regarding boy. the vinyl. Oh boy, Andy on the Midnight Madness vinyl. How many grooves are inside one? Grooves? Yeah, four. Mm, that's wrong. I have it's no a, idea. It, it's the same with every record. One. Uh, it's uh, one continuous groove. There you go. Yeah, see? I knew I'd get you on that. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> and by the way, I wanted to, I wanted to say when you're talking about the culture factory um pressing, I, I, I said something wrong in the last episode when I announced her website. I said culturefactory dot com. It's culturefactoryusa.com. dot com. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to clarify that in case anybody's still looking for that album. Yeah. <laughs> you can go to culturefactoryusa.com and, and pick it up. Yeah, You're welcome, Culture Factory. Only the best from us. That's right. <laughs> we love you. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking. I just wonder what culturefactory.com is sending them. Probably some... Uh... I think it takes you to there anyway. I think it takes you... Like, if you Google it, it'll take you there. Eventually. But yeah. I didn't... I just... Um, I, I wrote it down wrong. Probably yeah. takes you to a, a deep culture club <laughs> podcast yeah. called The Culture Factory. Um, well, they'll tumble for you. There it is. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, moving on, do we have any Night Ranger news to discuss before we uh, move on? Got a couple shows announced. Yeah. But we don't know. Well, we got sure one in Phoenix, it, Arizona, I think in October. Though. And when is, or that's new, yeah, no, no, that's November with Aria Speedwagon. When's the SeaWorld one, Josh? Do we know? <coughs> I do not know, uh, but. Uh, Playing SeaWorld. I'm not even in, sure in what. In Florida. Is it Florida? So, yeah, just go to, uh, I know the concert is included with the tickets. So, if you got a real big hankering mm -hmm. of seeing some 
fish. Yeah, the con- you know. I hope the concert's included with the ticket. Huh? He means admission. To the Whatever. Yeah, admission, I know, you know. I know. Really, like it, you would, if you, you it, go to Kings Island and go to Timberwolf Amphitheater, yeah. it was part of your admission. Yeah. So if you want to, always... so if you want to see Night Ranger and a fish riding a fucking bike, there you go. Okay. Uh, go to That's uh, sweet. Go to Sea World, Florida, Night Ranger, fish. Is that, is that like Spinal Tap and Puppet Show? That's what we ought to call this episode: a fish riding a fucking bike. Huh? I don't care if you are a fish. Get on that bike. I think I'm going to make a fans emotion logo with a fish riding a fucking bike right in the All middle right, of it. All right, so no new news, well, really, anything going on. We, and Joel's got his new CD coming out. So yeah. Joel Hoekstra's 13, go get it. Uh, we That's some new music for you as well. But, yeah, it's real. Again, just – and they're not updating the website with the concerts. Uh you could just say that they there's a, probably a thousand different reasons. Maybe they just don't, you know, it's kind of low key and they don't want that stuff out there. That could be one. They're just not updating it because you know they're on extended vacation, or these dates could probably change a hundred times. So they just let the venues kind of advertise it, and so I just know there's a lot of people who are upset that the website is not up being updated but all i can tell you is hey if you listen to this podcast we've been talking about those shows for weeks so mm-hmm. yeah all i see is when you say why are we just learning about these shows now all i see is you typing i'm not listening to i'm podcast. not listening to these three fucking yahoos which i understand really honestly but uh <laughs> <laughs> so, no one listens to us so there you go. Uh some Night Ranger Night Ranger shows. Uh I gotta listen to you guys a second time when I edit this thing. Yeah. It's so yeah. awesome. Yay, we're going to Hawaii. I just IV yeah. some booze into me. All right, what else we got? Oh, I know what we got. Uh it's not Night Wait, Ranger. Has anybody got any Night Ranger stuff they want to show off? Anybody well, anything new in the mail or anything you picked up at the local record mart? It's not Night Ranger stuff, but I we are on the Fans of Motion website. Selling autographed. It's in conjunction with the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> Are and, we now? Uh, autographed Josh Justofferson, Fans in Motion, Tigers hat. You can get your own. We started out with 25. I got maybe oh seven God. left. Uh, so, uh, as people have been telling me, they make great anniversary gifts. Um, Man, did, did you go on a riot this summer? Huh? No, uh, F- Detroit is actually endorsing us now. They've gotten a lot yeah. of positive feedback from Great. me wearing the hat. So for forty nine ninety five, if you want an autograph, Josh Stopperson Detroit Tigers hat, uh, yeah, uh, that includes uh, shipping and handling. So just like Tristan. So there you go. I have something new in Night Ranger that I picked up. Um, I had never seen this before. I'm sure you guys have, but I just happened to see it, so I picked it up. I didn't need it, but I have it. Can you see that there? Yeah. It's what live in Japan, right? No, it's like uh, the greatest hits. <coughs> it's CD. What's but this? It's, what's this? It, what's the CD it inside? It, it includes Sister Christian. Did you open it? What's the CD in there? What is the? What's the track list again? So the track list, is, uh, the one through twelve, is Sister Christian, Sentimental Street, When You Close Your Eyes, Don't Tell Me You Love Me, Sing Me Away, Forever All Over Again. Neverland, Touch of Madness, Goodbye, Slap Like Being Born, Someday I Will, You Can Still Rock in America. It might be live for all I know. That is yeah. Oh, wait, hold, uh, hold on. That is I just, rock just in Japan. Bottom, all selections are live performances. <laughs> yeah. that, that is rock in Japan. Uh, re, just repackaged. Repackaged. Yeah. I mean, it says on the back with this little picture here. You can see this. Yep. Those of you that are watching. The, the the description says you can range far and wide and you'll never find a better set of hard rocking heart string pours than this collection from Night Ranger. All of the band's greatest power ballads are here from Goodbye to Sentimental Street to the immortal Sister Christian. Which they always open a show with, like the Butch done. Walker, you know? So, uh, yeah, I saw this and I had just never seen it. I was out at a uh, local used record store here in Nashville and... Uh, Says it came out in 2011. Yeah, it's uh, it's Rock in Japan '97, and there has been 
probably five or six reish re big time in Tokyo. They've relate named it and. Isn't there one with the um with like a statue of an angel? There is one with like a uh, like a yeah like is that a, right? Yep, it's it says Sister Christian and other night yes. major hits. There's one with Seven Wishes, with Jack, Jeff, and Brad from the Seven Wishes era yeah. on it, and then there's one with like the Tokyo City skyline. All of them are rock in Japan '97 or Greatest Hits Live is what it's kind of been yeah. in the United States. Mm-hmm. So. That's all that, yeah, that's all that is, just a repackaging of it. Um, I thought at one time they they did something like that. They made like a cardboard sleeve. Yeah, that's. And we know how you get the CDs and it has the sleeve, but then the CDs right, pulls out yeah. and it's still got a hard shell case. Yeah. I thought they did that for live in Japan. I, I, I'll have to go back and look where it was a different sleeve and it's like Night Ranger's greatest hits. But then if you pulled the CD out, it was live in Japan. Uh, it was another way to market that, but I could be incorrect. So uh, is that something either one of you two have, or is that uh, I do not? I do not have that. Just that cover of not, it, not that pressing, no. Uh, yeah. I mean, not okay. that I haven't seen it. It's just one of those things where, you know, uh, listen, uh, it was like a dollar ninety five. Yeah, I like I, I got it. I like how many copies of <laughs> you know live in Japan ninety seven do I need? And every now and then I break down and and I buy one of them, which I just did. I thought we talked about it once on a podcast. I yeah. I can't remember what it was now, but uh, yeah. So no, I do not now. What I have gotten, and we talked about this on the bonus track episode, and I did not have it, but Brent does. Is the I guess the oh, Japanese yeah. or Korean version of uh, Twenty Four Strings and a Drummer. Yeah, which, mine didn't have an obi. My, my, mine's Korean, I believe. Well, this has a weird obi. It's kind of got the, oh, it wraps gotcha. around the back. This, no, this says Japan on it. So I guess yeah. So this has the regular twelve tracks, but it has the bonus tracks of "Boys of Summer" and "Touch of Madness." Oh, so love it. There you go. That's out there. And it came with the DVD as well. Still, uh, maybe should have. No, this just has the CD. Really? Yep. Yeah, I the one I got from Korea or what have you comes with the um, DVD to it, and it's everything's in English. It, it was done on Frontiers Records. It just um, I ordered mine from there because it was in a jewel case versus the American version was in a cardboard digi pack, like your 35 years in a night in Chicago. Gotcha. I, you know, I ordered mine from Japan, but my one from Japan for 35 years in a night in Chicago didn't come with the DVD either. So I just ordered the Blu-ray separately. So. And if you they guys. Had, they yeah. make two different pressings of it over there. And if you guys want one of those autographed Detroit Tigers, Josh Stofferson hats, forty nine ninety five. I can sign it to you or your one of your loved ones. Um, yeah. There you we, go. We got yeah. plug away. About Josh's seven. number for the Tigers was number one. So about seven left. Actually, what it was is uh, for those who are actually believing that uh, the Detroit Tigers are sponsoring us and that I'm selling this for forty nine ninety five. If you are believing that and you want it, sure, yeah, send it to me. But, uh, no, they were having a great sale. Buy one, get one free, and free shipping. So I'm like, I've worn Detroit Tigers hats for 25 years. I don't see that changing. Why not just order a hundred dollars worth and send them to me? And so, I'm good on Detroit Tigers hats for a while. Solid. Yep. That's uh, <laughs> that's how I how I go. Okay, they don't dry right by the time you get to the last one. You know. Hey, these things. Well, these are quality. I just can't believe you're not wearing a Reds hat. I just hate fucking bright red running around. You know. I got black ones. Yeah, but yeah, that, I just listen. I like the the dark blue, just a simple, simple script up there. Yeah, yeah. You look back at all the photos of whatever country I'm in. Usually, you see one of these. Detroit. I was pissed when I was coming home from Africa, and I was wearing a. I don't even know if I was wearing a hat, but anyways, I realized of all the shit I packed, the only thing I didn't pack was my Detroit Tigers hat because we had the. What is it? Mosquito netting on our beds. Mm -hmm. And I had these big poles on the corner of my beds. And that's where I hang my hat. And as I was packing up all my stuff, I forgot to grab it. So, yeah, that hat is out there. Some 
African kid out there just telling people that not only is this a Detroit Tigers hat, but have you ever heard of Fans of Motion? Well, if you have, uh, this is Josh Justofferson's uh, Detroit yeah. Tigers hat. So there you go. You guys have gotten the whole story wow. of how we are sponsored. What do we got next? Brent, I'm throwing it to you, my friend. Fans in Motion News. News. Are we, news. Are we sponsored by anybody other than the Tigers? I'll say this. Leave it to the D. Leave it to the what D. About, what about Surf City there? Or, uh, what's the Huntington, uh, what Huntington about, Beach? Hey, how about this? This uh, uh, what is this? The sandwich? Yeah, the, the sandwich. sandwich. Yeah, yeah, where, yeah, my, yeah, my food truck sponsoring it. Yeah, come yeah, to the. Andy front. has a food truck that he can't get up and running, <laughs> and he serves this stuff called a sandwich, yeah. uh, and um, Brent doesn't like it. Well, it's just not my forte. Okay. It doesn't matter. I like the ingredients. It's because you can't get a sandwich from him anyway, so you're yeah. going to have to get a fucking lemonade or a Pepsi Cola. I'll sell you a lemonade or a... <laughs> that uh, cool, refreshing drink. You know what you lemonade. need to do is you need to just run for political office there and change, change those. It. Yep. <laughs> Ass. <laughs> All right. Brent, give us some hot fans of motion news. Our hot, I'm, I'm hot, literally, literally hot. I'm on the edge of my seat. Well, our first um, shout-out. Did it? Didn't even pop up, did it? There we go. Our good buddy John Haynes, and I'm going to botch the name up because I always have and I always will, but Ton, Todd, God, right out it. of the game. Confessori? Confessori. Yeah, and the first yeah. name that you butchered was Todd. That's yeah, the Todd, one you messed up. <laughs> Todd Clint. Well, anyway, John posted his two year anniversary of his passing the other day, and, you know, it. it Pretty sweet, and I thought we should recognize it um, to recognize Todd. Todd was really special to the band, and along with a lot of fans, um, he, you know, he's yeah, missed. Absolutely, I don't recall whether I've ever met him. Have either one of you two I've, guys met? Did you ever I meet have not. Todd? I pretty sure it was. T- I talked to him 2011 uh, before a show when I was doing the meet and greet, and. There was one other time, maybe one of the Pickerington shows, but real quick, uh, nothing more than just maybe a, a minute conversation. I talked to him longer at the Detroit show in 2011 that I did the meet and greet with, but I can't f- remember what. Yeah. I, I think we talked. They were giving away like a, a like a poster with all the records on it that yeah. were already signed. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think we were talking about that. Uh, I just can't remember. I just remember I was like the first in line, so he was there, and we bullshitted, and I maybe I guess it was just bullshitting because I don't know if we talked about the band. I just think we talked about that poster a little bit, and I can't remember why, but I did really didn't have a relationship with him, but uh, a lot of fans did, and yep. if you go back and listen to the Eric Levy um, episode, Eric talks highly of him and how he was there for Eric you know, kind of, you know, being his guardian angel for him when Eric first joined the band. So uh, just something we really wanted to recognize. And John Haynes did a really good job, uh, you know, uh, you yeah, know, talking about yep, the guy. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Our next, I believe, is a new member. Uh, what is sorry. that? Joe uh, Casamata? Is it? Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's yeah. probably not the proper pronunciation, but it's pretty close. Well, I like I said, it's always this big Look at on that. my screen, that's so I can't see it. Stuff. Yeah, I loved his um, platinum um, Midnight Madness Award. And what's great about that is it's presented to MCA Records, so you don't have some random person hanging on your wall, yeah. which I would take anyway. I wouldn't care. <laughs> but very, very cool stuff um, that he, he, he shared, I believe it was today. Yeah, it was real recent. And if you ever are going to buy one of those awards, and I'm not saying anything about Joe or this one here, uh, do your research because they are one of the most highly uh, counterfeited items. And there are the only thing is there's good websites where you can go and figure them out. But then those counterfeiters are uh, learning those tricks as well. But uh yeah, there's certain ways you can just visually just figure out if it because they do they do a really good job at counterfeiting them. But uh, yeah, I mean, 
I'm not saying John. I haven't even looked at really the photo. I just saw that was posted. I just want people because they're not cheap. Uh, no. You know, if you're going to find one, it's usually 250 bucks at least for a band like Night Ranger. And I would say the cheaper you can get it, the more you probably need to do some research on it. I have a dumb question real quick regarding yeah. those uh, rewards. They don't actually use like the Midnight Madness album. It's just a, probably just a, a album. I, w- I was just going to add that. Okay. Yeah, if you look at if you there. look at them like you go to a Hard Rock Cafe, and you you see the ones they have hanging on the wall, they might say, you know, six tracks on the label, but there's only five tracks on the album. Right. You know, uh, back once upon a time, MTV broke a, broke open a Loverboy one after MTV went on the air, and it was some like Judy Garland music playing on it. Okay. You know, they, mm-hmm. you know just to see what it was playing. So yeah, they okay, just take good. stock and they spray paint those suckers or whatever and i figured that but i'm, I'm gonna ask since you brought it up so i'm sorry brent continue with your no 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 your uh, I, was, I, was, I was just gonna add it so it's, it's it's cool that you did that okay our next one is that's brian, brian holland i believe is that correct yes yes and brian's been teaching me some guitar on yeah, our page how about that? And in fact um this one i believe was touch of madness yes and and these are the only fingers that work when i play guitar that's all I need for this <laughs> this part of the song. I'm like, I can do this. So um, maybe. It's just that simple. Maybe next episode I'll have an amp down here and I'll stand up and I'll do it. And Josh will edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> what else but you got? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have two more. Uh, this one, we had to go with Dwayne Vickers. Dwayne Vickers, man, has been. It's Night Dwanger, by the way. Yes. Is Dwayne Vickers. That's what he goes. That's what his Look buddies that. call him, Night Dwanger. Look at that article. Um, he has been cooking on finding these articles from the 80s. He just posted one right before we came on air tonight. Um, just very cool stuff going back and seeing this old stuff. I, I've seen all the, you know, I think one was from Song Hits, and, yeah. you know, I, I remember all this stuff. Because you if I didn't I, buy it, if I didn't buy it, Andy and I were standing in Green Valley <laughs> looking through the magazines, reading everything, you know. Oh, my God. That's so fun. Yeah. we God, we did that all the time, didn't we? We were such dorks. Yeah, we were. And I've got one more. So since we had um, Dwayne, Knight Dwanger, we have, what's that say, Andy? Mark Hearts Away, Green Away. That's right. I figured if. He could be Night to Wager. Mark Greenaway could be Hearts Away. <laughs> anyway, what did he what did he give us? Oh yeah, he gave us the article from Kerrang Mag Kerrang magazine. Yeah. And now Night Ranger split. So, yeah. And I remember seeing that Kerrang and I think that was the first time I'd actually seen that Night Ranger had called it quits. Because, you know. Yeah. I didn't see anything on MTV. I, somebody even posted on the page. I, they saw something on MTV. I didn't see anything. Yeah, it's and, you know, Yeah, I remember that was a broken-hearted day. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mark Greenaway, Mark Hart's away, Greenaway. So nice. that, that's what I'm naming you. We, I, you know, we got Shapin' Shapin. We got Nadalman. Nadalman. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've got Hawk, how, how you say Hockstetter? Hockstetter. Dude, he's, I, he's, I, break, he's breaking down the albums, isn't he? I, yes, uh, he is. I uh, I say the names correctly. Again, uh, it's the best I can do is to say, listen, you guys just <laughs> jump on board with me here. And uh, uh, I do want to say, real, are you done, Brent? I'm done. This is where I throw it to Josh, but go okay. ahead and interrupt. Hold on one sec. So <laughs> I, I, I don't have the name because it's yeah. one of our Japanese uh, members. Did you catch, though, he was wanting to jam... Don't tell me you love me. And yeah. I was like, I was, I was so tempted to respond and say, dude, let me plug in my, my electronic kit and let's do it. But I did not. But I think that is so cool. And I, I mean, I have zero idea how to pronounce his name. Uh, so, but uh, hey, yeah. if you're out there. And I have zero idea on how to record that stuff and I do it. And so send Brent, it to how these people mix them all together. Yeah. It's like that Brent, dude, uh, when Paul Stanley did that, when he was doing songs just on guitar and singing, yeah. and then some drummer came in 
and he pieced himself in with Paul Stanley and then a bass player. I'm like, that's pretty freaking cool. Anyway, right, Josh, Brett, what do you have? Brett, toss away. Your toss off. Toss face. All right. Anyways, uh, before uh, I wanted to mention there was a comment on YouTube. Uh, it was on the uh, Man in Motion episode that we did. Coleman76 typed on there a comment. Hooked on your channel, guys. Been watching for two days straight here in Australia. It's great. So, hey, Mike. Hey, yeah. Good day, mate. That ain't a knife. This is a knife. Uh, so hopefully you are enjoying the Vegemite sandwich and some and a nice Foster's and whatever other Australian stereotypes I can think of. And... Wall bears give you syphilis. <laughs> That's one of them. Yep. So anyways, Coleman76, make sure you find us on Facebook as well. But uh, it was just neat seeing that someone's in Australia listening to us. So... Yeah, that on is awesome. That that's, yeah, that's uh, very cool. We're we're so much more international now. Uh, yeah, we are uh, we are interstate podcast affairs. Uh, <laughs> Look at this. Uh, so here you are. These are the tickets uh, for the Somebody. contest. Yeah, somebody's gonna win something. That we I put up a photo of just some extra. <laughs> <coughs> Holy shit! I got COVID. Um, so. Uh, it's, it's contagious. You should have been wearing your mask, fucker. Uh, wow. So, be the wine shirt. So, we did a. I had some extra stuff laying around. I posted the photo on the Facebook page. Told everybody. I think uh, leave a comment where they say one thing they enjoyed about the podcast or the page, and one thing they enjoy about the band. A memory, just something. We had thirty-five people. I think enter. There is no ticket one or two because I had to destroy those tickets, kind of opening the thing up. So the tickets start at three. So I'm just going to basically grab one here. So if you look, the tickets are 307014. So you don't need the, uh, well, 7014. Uh, but you don't, it's just the last two numbers are important. So, anyways, there you go. I'm going to take. So is that, is that one a winner? Negative. Show. I was just showing uh -huh. you what the because I went through the 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 post and replied to everyone and gave them a number. So I'm going to throw them in one of these uh, lim breath. limited edition Josh Stofferson Detroit Tigers hats. If you want one forty nine ninety five, throw them in there. Blah blah blah. Are blah, they blah. flex fit or do they have a band in the back? They are flex. Oh, I want a flex fit. Weird flex, but okay. No, like? actually, no, they got a band. Sorry. That's what the ah, kids say. Junk. Nope, Need a flex stuff. fit. All right. So uh, sure. let's do um, the first one. And again, these are just nothing crazy. It is from the 2009 Sticks. Are you a Speedwagon Night Ranger tour? It's kind of a postcard that has all the promotions on it and a feeding off the Mojo sticker. We are going with. Da -da 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 -da. Number six. So let's see who number six was. Dun, 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 dun. Oh. Number six was Todd Yorker. Hey, oh, Todd hey, Yorker. Where'd he go? Hey, Todd Yorker. All right. And Very active six. on the page. Good job, yep. Todd. The next is an unused Shaw Blades, December 7th, 2007. Ticket stub. It's kind of cool. It's good size and it's got the logo and everything on it. So, all right. Do, 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 do. What do we got there? What number? 11. 11. This one goes to 11. Who goes to 11, Josh? So, let's see who 11 is. It's one out of. Oh, Jennifer Grabowski. Jennifer Grabowski goes to 11. I said that name very well. Good. Uh, Jennifer. Hey. Shaw Blades, and I will send you guys private messages and let you guys know that you won or send me a message, whatever. The I next... would say they have to watch this or listen to this to know well, if they won. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, so, hey, if you're listening, message me. All right. Jeff Watson, cassette. Lone, Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger. And we got... Dun, 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 dun. I think it was very clean looking, by the way. 
what is that? Thirty or three? Three. 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 So um, that would be Patty Source. Ooh, I think Patty. She's, I think she like posted a picture of her bedroom or like the walls that one time yeah. with all the. Nightmares. Yeah, we we featured her on one of the um, fans of motion parts of it. All right. Oh yeah. She had the big um, poster. Seven Wishes poster, I believe it was. Next one is the Forever All Over Again. CB uh, Single. Has that and anything for you on it. And we have a copy, Don't Let Up, CD and DVD are in there. Oh, that's the deluxe version. Um, so there you go. Wow, and that's a nice... we are going to pick. Please pick me. Uh, fifteen. You got 15, upside down. George Foster, upside down. Fifteen is all right. Fifteen is Gail Romaine, Roman, one of the two. So the Gail, oh. there you go. You got some CDs. Good. Congrats, nice Gail. Win there, Gail. Congrats. And the last is a couple forty fives. We got Sentimental Street, and the Secret of My Success. And American we, 45s? American. We are okay. going with... Number 30, 34. 34. So let's go down. That's towards the end. Uh, Melissa Gong and her sentimental street yeah, pants or whatever they were. Uh, so... I don't know if you guys remember that, but Melissa Gong, there you go. So those are our winners. Congrats, everybody. Um, and we'll, Best custom logo ever, by the way. <laughs> we will uh, we will do more of those uh, throughout the year. That was our first one that we've done. J.C. Powers has obviously done some things with the picks, yeah. and I think John Haynes has done a few things. Yeah. And uh, so For people. Yeah, and we, we're actually doing another one because we said we we're doing a Tristan Avakian right at the beginning of the episode. So oh, yes. uh, there you go. So, hey. It's hey, a, it just shows, man, how cool this page is besides <laughs> just how the great keeping Night Ranger alive and moving. You can win stuff. You People really win on MTV. Yeah, think about it, man. You get you got a <laughs> Night Ranger podcast out there. We got some new music coming. It's all good. All right. <laughs> So congratulations to the winners. Um, or last but not least, anybody got any uh, new music or books or movies or TV shows or documentaries they want to spread the word about? Andy, do you have any new TV shows, books, or documentaries you want to talk about? Um, I do have some you new do. music. Well, not it's. I shouldn't say it's not new music. I was at the used record store and picked up that Night Ranger. But I picked up three more other CDs that I just, you know, I don't God, have. Be and I it. Well, be the scared. first one. Let me preface this by saying I am not, never have been a huge uh, Springsteen fan. Mm. I'm but scared. I, uh, I, 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 I'm a very, very, very amateur songwriter, and I'm trying to understand songwriting better. So I just picked up the uh, the essential Bruce Springsteen. Because is that, uh, is that a CD single? <laughs> well, you know, Brent, you know as well as I do. I mean, Brent and I rag Springsteen a lot, but uh, the man can write a song, and I have to give him credit where credit's due. And I have zero Spring. Well, I shouldn't. I have one Springsteen, but anyway, I picked up the essential Bruce Springsteen. It's uh, thirty tracks. Josh, you're probably very familiar with it. I, you and I have had a conversation I about it. I bought that CD on a shitty rainy. I think it was raining. It was a Here real bad day in Kuwait before he we went really? to Iraq. You know, that's back when we had discs. I had a disc back or a CD player back in our tent. Now, when I got it, it was three disc and it was in like a bigger case. Yeah. I don't know if it's three discs now. This is two. The, yeah, the one disc was all like demos and everything. It's probably the one that they uh, they probably cut out. But uh, you can't go wrong with Springsteen. Uh, I mean, if you can't crank up Badlands, uh, yeah. you got issues. Yeah. Uh, Springsteen is the one I always say lyrics are not that important to a song because when you hear a song you're like wow that's great all right tell me what the lyrics were yeah. you might be able to say a couple but it's the melody and the beat great lyrics to a shitty melody aren't going to get you anywhere but a great melody with shitty lyrics now lyrics become important later on but uh uh 
Springsteen's the only one where you know his lyrics just they take you on a story. Uh, yeah, you know, Thunder Road and anything off the river. I mean, well, just the, the, say, t- the title track, the river. But Thunder uh, Road is a just. I heard that song once, probably two years ago, out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting it to come on my playlist, and I didn't even know what the song was when I heard it. That's how much I don't know about Bruce Springsteen. It was actually being sang by uh, Brian Vander Ark, Brent. You know that guy I like oh. from the Verve Pipe. And I'm like, God, the song's really good. Then he gets to the chorus of Thunder. I'm like, Oh shit, that's a Springsteen song. Yeah. If so it, maybe step back and reevaluate. Maybe I need to pay a little bit of attention to Springsteen. I would just I loved the song as I blindly listened to. Tell it. you go crank up Badlands. That, that's that's what I've been told. Is you don't you know, some people in this know like Born in the USA and all that stuff. You just go crank up Badlands and you'll be fine. And one of my favorite records is the one that came out after Born in USA, which is Tunnel of Love. And Tunnel of Love, the title track, is the worst track on that album. Uh, uh, Brilliant Disguise is one of the greatest songs ever written. So, yeah, I, it's just amazing just how great he, he was. And I saw him in concert a few years ago. I couldn't believe how good that was. And, and it's just when you hear stories like The River, he submitted that record to the record company. They liked it, and then he didn't like it, and basically pulled it back, and re and like re recorded the whole record, made it a double record, and only used like two songs from that first album yeah. that he presented them. And and there is like there's a if you get the box set of the river, there's a disc that has about eighteen songs that he wrote and recorded and didn't put them on there. And some of these songs are just so fantastic. Stevie Van Zant mentioned a couple of them, and he's like careers are built on songs like roulette and stuff that are some of those songs and he's like yeah he just and they had to like like, okay moving on man i got another song to sing about the jersey shore oh two three and they were pissed that he kept throwing away his hits like uh what was the one that patty smith sang um because the night because the night that was bruce springsteen wrote that and then he was saying that too and he was going to he was going to give away hungry heart And his record company or his manager finally said, you got to stop. I mean, that's a hit. And so he kept it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good place to, to start. But uh, he's yeah. he's definitely one of those album guys where you just got to put a record in. And we talk about Springsteen with Tristan Avakian because I mentioned that this record that Tristan has as Waters very much reminds me of Nebraska. Oh, yeah. I so, yeah. So yeah, good little uh, segue there. What's the other two discs you got? So the other thing I got, I think, um, including maybe Brent, I may be one of only four people that actually uh, saw this movie and appreciate this soundtrack. But it's a movie called Tapeheads. Tapeheads. Wow. Uh, this is a very, very, very cult film that starred John Cusack and Tim Robbins. Um, it's not great. But I man, can't I, even remember the movie. I mean, I've seen it, and I don't even remember it. Well, the beauty of this is there's a song in the... T- and I won't go deep on it, because no one's going to ever care or watch it. If you want to watch a, a very just odd cult film, pull up tape hits, if you can find it. But there's a song in there uh, called Baby Doll that they do a, a fake video for this band, but the song is actually sung and written by the band Devo. So there's that. From Akron, Ohio. And last but not least, uh, because Dave, as you say, the Dalman and I have been messaging each other back and forth a little bit over our absolute love of Eddie and the Cruisers. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those things like, you know how um, oh, there's like a cult of people that like always have to have, buy a copy of Catcher in the Rye when they see it. I feel compelled when I see Eddie and the Cruisers to just uh, pick it up and handle well, it. Well, you, you know why that is, don't you? Because you lose all your CDs because you don't put them anywhere. Yeah, right now they're all in boxes and not even in the same spot in my basement. There's a box here and there's two boxes over there. But anyway, that's my CDs for the purchases. For that. And I spent a total of like $18 combined for four CDs. And if you want to real, hear a detailed you know, explanation of the Lost Eddie Wilson record, go back to our Damn Yankees uh, third album that's never been released episode and 
we do a little bit. We do a little bit of a dive on just how that record was recorded, and no one ever heard it. And then it was it surfaced, and there's a great documentary out there on it called Eddie and the Cruisers Two. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. Oh, oh, it is not great. You're fast and loose with the term "great." There, that movie oh, no, is. It's 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 good. Uh, horrid, I would say. And it's a documentary, not a movie. <laughs> So, so that's all I got for now. You guys yeah. got anything you want to add to this part? Uh, of the show? Every time yeah. he says documentary, I go right to Galaxy Yeah, our, yeah, we're getting great with this. We're yeah. at the, we're at the fifty minute mark. So hey, you know, after fifty minutes, you're home for your hour commute. You still got to listen to Tristan Navaki, and so uh, in. yeah, we really got to trim these down. Yeah, we we're horrible. We're getting worse. All right, hey, I'm just going to look for 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 time. Uh, hey, here's Tristan Navaki. Why did I put? So much bullshit around it Whatever it is I have finally found it A lost key in the back Of a dusty old drawer If it's only the lock In some forgotten door Maybe it's time I found out what it's for I believe that it's time we got out of the circus. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. We have another great guest with us on the uh, Night Ranger Fans in Motion podcast. Joining Andrew, Brent, and myself is Mr. Tristan Avakian of the Ultimate Queen Celebration with Mark Martell come from away and from musical theater and also how he entered the night ranger world was he was a night ranger on reserve for the years 2010 through 2012 uh tristan thank you for joining us my friend thank you josh thanks for having you guys now uh we were debating originally on uh, whether or not to even have you on this podcast, because with you being a guitarist, you have way too many syllables in your name. And, uh, and... That's my theory, yes. <laughs> Tell us what that theory theory is again. You get three syllables. Brad Gillis, Jeff Watson, <laughs> Jimmy Page, Keith Richards, Mick Ronson. The list goes on and on. Um, Jimi Hendrix gets four because he's Jimi Hendrix. He's allowed. Uh, Jeff Beck only needs two, <laughs> but those are the sole exceptions. Well, if I guess somehow, but and yet here I am. Well, if it was 1981, we could just change it to Trist- Tristan Kean. Tristan Kean, did that work? Take off the uh, the AVA. I don't know. Is that is that how we would do it, Brent? Uh, you... I've been called all kinds of things. Well, so have I, but it's usually uh, uh, how <laughs> many. Just keep it. How many, yeah, company, yeah. how many syllables are are in uh, motherfucker? Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, oh, I forgot. Brian May. See, yeah. it's it's across the board. Well, it's not really a theory, though. You're convincing me that it's fact. Uh, yeah. So, Tristan, we we just interviewed Brandon Etheridge. We know you have a long musical history with him. Joel uh, talked about you highly in his interview. Uh, where does this where does this all kick kick off for you? Where were you uh, born and raised? I was born and raised in New York City, and uh, that's where I met Joel. Actually, Joel was uh, Joel was new in town, and, and so in New York City is uh, that's where you. High school and graduated like all your born and youth? raised. Yeah, I born and raised in Manhattan. I also I spent a few years in in L. A. Um, as a kid when my parents got divorced, and that's where I picked up guitar. Was in L. A. Yeah, because I wasn't going to be a surfer, you know. <laughs> so, so, what drove you to pick up the guitar? Was there a certain artist? Was you know, uh, were you into music at school? What what was the passion to pick up the guitar? Well, previously, I, you know, um, I'd sort of had forced guitar lessons, but the only thing that I remember about it was, was, uh, you know, when I was waiting for my mom to pick me up, I was about eight or nine, I was about eight or nine waiting for my mom to pick me up. Um, 
afterwards, there was this kid that would always punk and bully me. That's all I remembered about it. Oh, yeah, and that that and having to learn, you know, Michael Rowe, the boat ashore, which I wasn't too into. And um, then when I was 12, I heard uh, back to back, my sister played me Voodoo Child, Slight Return and Heartbreaker. And that was it. It was like Zeus throwing lightning bolts. just. <laughs> and I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. You know, I've been living with the consequences of that decision ever since. Yeah. I've been living with a decision made by a 12 year old ever since. <laughs> Did, when so when you're when you're playing guitar and you're hearing this stuff uh were you uh did you find that it was easy to, were you was it easy to learn were you better than most kids your age when did you know that you know hey i'm pretty good at this well i was really motivated uh you know in la like if you don't have a car you're a non-entity and so a 13-year-old is inherently a non-entity. I spent a lot of time in my room. Uh, I was pretty isolated. There was no way to get around, really, by public, except by public transportation, you know, like by bus, which they called, everybody called the loser cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, wasn't really, I, I wasn't really, like, I was new there. I didn't really have much of a social life anyway, so I just stayed in my room, and I played along with records. I mean, before, now there's amazing stuff. There's YouTube you know, you could slow it down. Uh, there's something called sound slice where, 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 where actually they've, they've got notation and tap going along with the guitar solo. So you, you can loop sections, mm -hmm. slow it down. I mean, there's just amazing tools now, yeah. but back then we had nothing like that. What I had was vinyl and I would literally pick up the needle and move it the same phrase over and over again. And after about a year of that, my records were pretty beat up, but I, I could pretty much play everything like on Led Zeppelin one front nice. to back and also if i heard something on the radio that i like you know it's the, the way we did you would hit, just hit record on the cassette you know you had these boom boxes you just go oh and uh and try to grab it yeah and so i cut that that was kind of where i got my vocabulary now because really, i wasn't because i wasn't going to shows at that point yet either it was just 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 in my room with a record player and half speed you could slow records down to half yeah. speed which was amazing now at that time, what who were your go-to uh, records? Who were the artists that you were really digging? Well, like you know, like I said, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, those are two really big ones. Uh, I remember the first time I heard Rush; it was like a transmission from another world. Yeah. Uh, uh, Frank Zappa, I saw every time he came to town. Uh, Robin Trower is another big right. one. And who was? So I, I, saw, I saw a lot of these guys, in, you know. In, in arenas so it made it made a really had a really powerful made a really powerful impression on me what was your first show i know you said you saw uh zap and stuff who was your first concert that you saw ah <sighs> jeez you know uh i don't know i remember seeing uh I, I remember that i didn't see led zeppelin at long beach arena because i was grounded <laughs> I I I I've been like a disobedient little shit for for some reason or whether or whatever and the only thing my mom could hold over me was those, that the, oh. that ticket so she took it away. Wow. Yeah. Oh. That's, wow. That was that was brutal. You don't think about the ones that you got to as so much as the ones that you missed and that was a big one. Absolutely. Now uh oh. you're in high school and did you have any ambitions of what you were going to do after high school how did music you know come, become not just a passion but a career what was the well, first I was going to be a musician that was it I already made up my mind mm -hmm. so when I moved back to New York with my dad uh, I immediately went AWOL and started going downtown and started playing in bands uh, in, in venues like Max's Kansas City Ray Coke Sleeves CBGB's all the iconic venues oh, I just kind of went I just kind of went feral like immediately <laughs> and so you're playing at these are you are you just sitting in are you in your own bands how what are you uh what's the environment you're playing in i would play with anybody but it was mostly it was it was mostly grimy loud chaotic uh punk rock and uh and just this weird area it was a really interesting time to be making music in new york because there was um kind of like I, I don't know if you call it progressive music but there was there was a there was kind of a um if, you, if there was, if you made a Venn diagram, there was a big area where, where rock and roll and punk rock, and 
and Artie Weirdos kind of interlapped. So uh, I got a so I got a very wide range of experience, and I would also play um, with R and B artists and with what you know what became hip hop. Basically, it was just whatever was coming up um, from the street. I was part of a scene uh, that was where there were a lot of people coming through. Mm -hmm. It was a I was at a pot dealer's loft. He was one of the biggest pot dealers. <laughs> And so everybody would come by, and I mean everybody from every genre. And all, the guy had, I was playing in his band, and he had a mind-blowing collection of vintage guitars. Back then, he was smart enough. He was back then they were old guitars, Those yeah, they were worth anything. And he was snapping them up. So I'd be there playing like a '54 Strat, you know, like a pristine, uh, you know, '54 Strat or whatever. And yeah. while 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 everybody was getting baked and playing chess, and that was the way I met most of the people that I knew in the business. Now, at this time, are you mainly just performing live, or are you doing any studio work, or is it both? Some studio work, uh, mostly live. It's, the studio work that I was doing wasn't as a session guy. I kind of moved into that later. It was mostly band stuff. Okay. I would say it was band stuff. What, what time frame are we talking about year-wise? I'm just trying to wrap my head around the, the 80s, time. You know, like, like, like 80s, early, mid-80s. Okay. When uh, I, I had my twenties in, in the eighties, and thank God. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, good time to be a young man in New York City, I'll tell you. That. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you have something that you considered your first big break, like something that you knew was bigger than what you had been doing? Probably when I I got uh, the call to play. Um, well, I was I was in I was in a band called the Pedantics that had a record deal, but it kind of went nowhere. Uh, the, I guess as far as big breaks go in 90, in 91, a couple of things happened. I played with a band, uh, well, with an artist named Deborah Blando. She was, um, the protege of, uh, David Wolf, Cindy Lauper's ex-manager. He was kind of make, trying to make her in the new Cindy Lauper. She had a deal on Sony. So all of a sudden I was in, uh, I was, I was playing with a major label artist and working on I've a heard, real I've heard I've heard that name before. Yeah, working on a real record in real studios with a real producer, Eric Thorngren, who was an absolute riot, and just whatever I wanted. Uh, uh, I wanted to play through a 54 basement. There it was. Wow. wow. So, now, so when... it was, that was a great experience, and I met David Rosenthal, who will come, who will come up later. Now, when you get... I also, played, I also wound up playing a little bit on Mitch, with Mitch Beloy on his first album. Which... Uh... Mitch Malloy is currently what singing with Great White, Great White. if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Um, back to you getting, you know, that gig, and you're talking about, you know, hey, I want to play through this amp, and boom, it's there. Does that change your mindset? Like, you know, hey, I liked what I was doing, but I like this more. <laughs> uh, I liked everything. I mean, it yeah. was that, that was that was one of the great things about working in New York was there was a, just a vast range of experience. But I liked, I, I definitely liked being able, picking up a phone and being able to get endorsements and stuff like that. It was, it was, I was still like a snot nosed kid. Yeah. I hadn't really made my bones yet. I didn't really have credibility, but it's, you know, there, there was a wider aperture. And I was also a staff producer for a company called RVI, which did uh, karaoke. It was, but it was, a, they had, this was a Japanese company that had deep, deep pockets. They basically took over. A fantastic studio with like a, you know, like a George Martin console, like a George Martin Neve, and every engineer and every musician in the city worked on this stuff because it was a steady check. It was like a, it was, it was kind of like a factory, and that and I met a lot of people that I, uh, that I'm friends with and that I know now through that scene. And also, a, a, a really great thing about that was, they only wanted number one records. That was the sole criterion. And I got all the rock stuff. I was so I was producing, uh, I was producing these records. I was reverse engineering number one hits. So I really got uh, to figure out what makes a rec, what makes a hit record tick. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, it's, and you, you never, I guess you never think about that. I mean, we've all sang karaoke, but who's drunk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but who's but who's producing all of that? Let me ask you this. Now just, it's a good deal less expensive, but back mm -hmm. then. Like, 
they were they were scrupulously recreating whatever was on the record and they spared no expense it wasn't one guy with pro tools it was yeah. like yeah if there were strings on the record they, they would put a string date wow really yeah it was heavy so let me ask ask this this is just i guess because i don't know exactly how it would work is how do you wind up on a let's say mitch malloy how do you wind up on that album do you have a manager that's you know looking out for you and getting you those gigs is it through connections how does let's say you wind up playing on that record it is all connections i tried to get a manager i tried to get uh, an agent and you know i've had a couple of meetings but you know what they would tell me stuff like what you make is deli a 10 percent of what you make is deli tray for this office hmm. it's not enough so you really what you do is you just kind of weave you just kind of weave in and out of traffic. I think with Mitch, <laughs> the best of my recollection, that was David Rosenthal's thing. He was kind of the MD, and he 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 had been in a band with Mitch, and Mitch recommended me. And you so are it's all, personal, it's all personal recommendations. And that's probably how you came to play on the Mariah Carey album. Is that correct? No, actually, that was a guy that I played with in a band called The Turtles. He, he he wound up being an exec at Sony, and he called me up out of the blue. Okay. To and... play uh, play on the record because he's because he was uh, he was Matola's right hand man. All right. He was Matola's fixer. <laughs> wow. So, so you're wow. doing you're doing yeah. this session work and this live stuff in New York. Where does it take you to next? Uh, well, the next thing that happened, I guess, was I, I wound up in Rosenthal's band. He got a deal in Japan, and uh, he, it was really more of a project. He, he already had a name and some songs and even some recordings. It was a co-write with Mitch and uh, some demos. We got together and started writing. I contributed some material, and it sort of turned into a band. But he, he already had a deal in place. He'd made... Uh, a deal with when he was over in Japan with Rainbow, he made a deal with the top concert promoter in Japan who was getting into the record. Is that business. And we Mr. Were, Udo? Is that Mr. Udo? Udo, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was, it was, we were going to be like Udo's, uh, you know, like, like big breakout act. So, so um, it never happened. We sort of got wiped out by the whole Seattle t tsunami, but, but we made a good, <laughs> we made a good record. And I still get calls about that, actually. I still get, like, messages from around the world, from places where they really love melodic rock, like Greece and Italy, and people asking me how to play. How, do you, how did you play that lick, you know? So this is of... this was the band Red Dawn, correct? Yeah. Okay. And then that featured, what, members of, uh, well, you said, I think we were talking Rainbow, uh, Chuck Burgey, who I think also had a uh, Glenn Burtnick connection from... Uh, an episode in the past, but, uh, so you well, guys the thing about, if you, if you wind up, that's the thing about coming up in a place like New York, you meet everybody. Mm -hmm. early. So yeah, it was Chuck, uh, Greg Smith and David. Those were the ex rainbow members and me and this incredible singer, Larry Baud, like Coverdale level, just ridiculous singer. Really? Cool. Yeah. And this came out like right at the height of grunge. So, you said this was a Japanese deal. Now, did you guys relocate to Japan to record this? And I wish it was the whole reason I did it was to tour Japan because I've always felt a great uh, affinity for the culture, and I practice formal Zen and uh, and karate, and I've always I've always felt a great affinity affinity for the culture. But no, we never got over there. We did the record at Dreamland, which is a fantastic studio mm. in upstate New York. So no complaints there. It's the best I've ever recorded. And probably the best I've ever played. So uh, no, you know, no complaints about that. We had Dave Whitman, who was a fantastic engineer. And and when it came to the guitar stuff, it was my call. I did whatever I wanted to do. Does it? Uh, and maybe you're at that point. You're maybe too young to really think about it. But uh, is is it like an emotional roller coaster when <sighs> you're? You know, you okay? Hey, we're going to form this band, Red Dawn. It's got all this potential. You got this backing. You got a record deal. You can do all your own guitars. All this positive going into it, and then it just doesn't really materialize how you think it's going to. Is is that something that's demoralizing, or by that point where you like, hey, that's the business. I'm just on to my next thing, and you know, don't look back. Or is it a combination of both? It's a learning experience. 
you, it definitely fosters some some objectivity. Right. You know, it's a big world, and like it's not it's not all about you. Mm-hmm. And also, also, it's you know, there's a lot of a lot of people will, will blow smoke up your butt. Everybody comes out of the woodwork, you know, and they all go away the second it's over. So it's really like it's it's a learning experience. But I forged you know relationships and and that experiences that will last a lifetime. So you know, no regrets. So Red Dawn kind of falls apart. Where are you going then after that? Uh, I was working in a music store. <laughs> and uh, because the bottom kind of fell out of the Guitar Hero business. But then I started writing. Uh, and I, I really, I recognized actually what was going on in Seattle. Because like I said, I came up in the punk rock clubs. I, I got high with Johnny Thunders. I played with Sil Sylvain. Mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, that was that was the that was the ocean in which I swam. So I recognized it. I was like, I know how to do this. This is just the sex. This is this is just the Sex Pistols plus John Lennon. <laughs> uh, so I started writing, and uh, you know, I became I became a singer songwriter, basically. And basically, it was. Were you, uh, you know, that or die? Were you? And it wasn't, I wasn't about to die. So were you putting out any albums, albums, were you touring or were you just kind of hitting the local circuit and just uh, making a living playing the uh, local, the local circuit? And I wound, up, I wound up getting a deal of my own and, uh, and that, that felt that fell through too. Basically that there was another tsunami that happened around 2000. Um, the, the, some Seagram's era bought every record label and consolidated yeah. for Universal and, mm. and 250 acts got dropped, and mine was one of them. Wow. wow. But uh, but in the meantime, I'd done, like, really solid work, and uh, I also did a record with Jim Carroll, um, and, uh, which is probably, that's probably my favorite thing that I've ever done. It was uh, a really, it was just a really interesting album, if you look it up. It's called, Pool, it's called Pools of Mercury, and I think that's about what it, I think that's about what it sold. It sold Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really, it was, it was really uh, interesting. And once again, we got to do uh, whatever we wanted, and that included included like sound design and spoken word. There was one, there's one track called uh, um, something. I, I, for, I forget what it's called. Something for Kurt Cobain, like poem for Kurt Cobain. Eight or fragments for Kurt Eight Cobain. Fragments for you just found it yeah yep. and uh i basically created the whole track under his spoken word and uh that was that so that was um um that was interesting i also worked with d snyder on um, on a film called strange land i created a lot of the uh, i watched that movie uh, that's a great movie yeah. yeah i created a lot of the cues just with once again it was just sound design and eerie like arty guitar stuff that yeah. didn't really sound like guitar i really got to stretch out can i ask you um because we're all uh, we're, we're not the same age but we're all in the same vein what's your thoughts on that seattle sound did you did you look at it as it destroying what you were working on or do you do you at least look at it as like yeah it's it's decent music it it, it put a bump in the road for sure well at first i resisted it because it was I, i'd worked really hard on my craft and yeah. all of a sudden I, I, you know, I had people kind of sneering at me because technical facility, unfortunately, had become conflated with credibility. And yeah. to me, they're not mutually exclusive. You you don't have to choose. Right. You can be technically proficient and you can have something to say. It isn't one or the other, but lack of ability had gotten conflated with um, meaning and artistic credi- credibility. And so there was... Basically, there was a lot of garbage in the mix. They were signing everything that sounded Seattle. Yep. And that was, I think that was watering it down. And I'd seen that happen before. So it was, it was like, oh, this again. Well, like Brent and I struggled because it was, we were loved the Sunset Strip. And Brent, I'm not trying to speak for you, but initially, like we, as a lot of our generation, we saw that grunge area is just killing the Sunset Strip. Mm-hmm. But I also can look at, like, my my better half is a huge Pearl Jam fan, so I go to a lot of Pearl Jam shows, and you know I actually liked a lot of Nirvana stuff, even though it kind of was the death knell for, you know, Rat and Dokken and all that. But 
I still like it. It's still, and I just always wondered from a musician's point of view, from somebody who's trying to make a living doing that, did it really pull the rug out from under you? And did and did you resent it, or are you okay with it? I resented it at first until I examined it. Yeah. And then I realized that there was some really strong songwriting at work. Yeah. And some really powerful songwriting. I agree. And, right. and some really bad songwriting, too. Really bad <laughs> songwriting, but there was some awful songwriting on the Sunset Strip stuff, well, too. Because, yeah. Because, yeah. Because, because commercial pressures, I mean... You know, I mean, Janie Lane, poor guy. Oh. He wrote, he, he wrote a, like, a, like a story song called Uncle Tom's Cabin, and he wanted it to be the lead-off. Uh, yeah. The, the lead-off, and it was about some real stuff, you know, that like that kind of he experienced in this world that he'd come from. And they shot it down. And they, they, uh, they don't, and so he wrote Cherry Pie in five minutes. Yeah. For the rest of his life, he was the Cherry Pie guy. He hated it, and there was there was, and he hated it, and there was a there was a lot of that going on. There was guys were all going to the same stylists, the same hairdressers, mm -hmm. the same photographers, the same song doctors, and they were all coming out the same. Yep. So Seattle was necessary. It was a necessary correction. I think the once, once the labels jumped on the bandwagon, then they watered it down and they started signing garbage the way they always do. And uh, that was that was uh, that was unfortunate. But at the core of it were some guys that were really writing, doing quality work. It's some really like um Hard hitting, disturbing stuff. Like I mean, the, like weird, hairy, fantastic. Like I loved Soundgarden. Yeah. And I loved Alice in Chains. I could I couldn't listen to all of Dirt in one sitting because I would start feeling psychotic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but man, it was just so good. Yeah. There was like, there, you know, like those those <laughs> guys really they they had their craft together. They were they're very distinct. I mean, there's no one who sounds like Lane Staley. No one can sing like Chris Cornell. Everybody started imitating Lane Staley, which was really irritating. Oh, and no one can like, understand Eddie Vedder. That was like that was like the federally mandated voice that everybody had to have for for five years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, and, you know that kind of helped me as a songwriter because I was like, you know what? It's it's baritone. I'm a baritone. I I never I was always afraid to open my mouth because I wasn't a tenor. Yeah. You had to be like you you had to have mind blowing chops and be you had to have an incredible tenor. Or, or, or you were nothing, right? And all yeah. it got a, a lot more, demo, you know, the voice got a lot more democratic, which I think was positive in a way because a lot of people with great voices, I mean, I don't want to name any names, but like where, where God gives them here, yeah, gets left out between the ears. <laughs> Maybe because they because everything they sing sounds great, they right. don't have to write good lyrics, right? Yeah, you know, they could read it, they could they could read out of the phone book, and it would it would sound like the voice of God, yeah. Right, so there's so there's some there's something to be said for that, like the like the Elvis Costello approach, like okay, I'm just going to beat him with my brain. Right. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, at, at the, the extreme end of that is like folk music or rap, where where like it's where where it's not where it's not necessary. It's the quality of your it's the quality of your lyrics, or you know, in a lot of art music, it's the quality of your ideas, not your chops. But that's like I said, that's where the problem begins. That's where, because rock critics have to justify their. Oh, they suck. <laughs> I'll say it for you. They have to. They have, they have to just. They have. They have to justify their their expensive education. Um, yeah. And and, and they're and, but they don't know. Pardon my friends. They don't know shit about music. <laughs> right, but they want to tell you what to listen to. Yeah, but they don't know <laughs> shit about. They don't know shit about music, and they 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 conflate naivete. Um, and lack of ability with substance, and that's a, like that's like a fatal mistake, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. So you can sing like you can sing like a crow, but you better be you better be singing about some real shit. You better, you better be you, you better come bring your A game in the songwriting department or something. You have to bring something to the table. So after that album that was bought, uh, that was basically when you, when Universal dropped and everything. Where did you go after that? Was well, after that, I was I was in I all of a sudden was in a serious relationship. I had a baby on the way, and I had to make money, so I moved into musical theater. I had already done one sh I'd already done one show um, called Hedwig down at the Jane. I was in the original production of that. I'd been I I didn't need the money. Mm -hmm. I was just doing it for fun. The money was the money was crap. Is that I really the same uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch? Yeah. I yeah. was in the original production of that. I really liked the show. And so I started sending out resumes to Broadway contractors. I called up the union and said, what do I do? And they said, well, 
come down and get a list of contractors. You know, they didn't have email back then. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, you know, you got went down and you got a Xerox, and I started started sending letters to these guys, and I got a call, and it was terrible. It was the last three weeks of a bus of a bus and truck, of Saturday night fever. But a bus and truck is that's like when a musical has been touring for three years, it's on its third producer, and they and they're just beating the crap out of it. It's all one nighters. And the guy probably saw the schedule and he looked at the last six weeks and he, and he was like, uh, uh, I'm out, <laughs> you know, he just bailed. So they were like, well, what are we going to do? Well, there's this guy. So I was that guy and I didn't really, I, I, I hadn't really had any experience with reading. Hedwig was easy. You're just a rock and roll band and there's only eight songs and you play the songs easy. This was stuff with cues and underscore and it was conducted, but I had a, I got the book a couple. I got it in FedEx a couple of days in advance, and I got together with a friend of mine who was a film composer who'd hired me some things. And I was like, "How do you read this thing?" <laughs> it's like, ah, here's what you do. And I threw it in a digital performer, which was on my laptop, and I just, I, I just, I just drilled down into it for a couple of days, and I knew it good enough. Awesome. And once you do one of those, particularly a really tough one, where they're just beating the crap out of. The, the last dregs of this production. If you do that and you survive, then you'll get called for other stuff. And so it went. What was and the... it was a good fit because because right then the bottom fell out of the industry because of like because of because of uh, downloading. Yeah, Napster. And the, yeah, the big budgets were gone. And it's I like I said I had a baby. I had to do something, and there it was. So you're doing the uh, the musicals. What was the first, I guess, musical that wasn't. Uh... As you said, a bus and truck that was actually a good, uh, you know, a, a better gig than that. What was the next one that you worked on? Then? Well, I was subbing in a show called Love Janice, and that brings us to Joel Hoekstra, actually. Yep. Because that was his first gig in New York. And there was two, it was, it was a show about Janis Joplin. It was actually by Janis Joplin. It was, the book was Her Letters to Her Sister. Mm-hmm. And there were two Janices in the show. There was a speaking Janice and a singing Janice. And the singing Janice was this fantastic singer from Chicago. And she brought her whole band. One of them was, well, most of her band. I think they picked up the rhythm section in New York. But she brought her guitar players. And one of them was Joel Hoekstra. And so I had, uh, I had helped the drummer get the gig. He wanted to audition with a bass player. So I picked up a bass. So they needed, they needed a bass sub. So they asked him, well, what about that guy? And he called me up and I said, sure. So there I am playing bass in Love, Janice. And then I started subbing for the other guitar player. And then I started subbing for Joel. And the funny thing about it was there was all this tension backstage. Everybody hated each other. <laughs> so it was, except for Joel. Joel is just the nicest guy. He's yeah. like, but, but there was so much drama backstage that a lot of the times he just needed a break. So I wound up being in there every night of the week because there was all this, well, if that guy's coming in, I'm not coming in. Oh, if that guy's coming in, I'm not coming in. So I wound up doing it like musical chairs, like playing a different instrument like <laughs> every oh night of the God. week. And that was great because it was right downtown. It was a great, uh, you know, it, it was great fun, actually. For a bass player, it's, it, the show was in two halves. The first act is Big Brother. And the second act is Janice's solo career. And so the first half is rock and the second half is R and B. So the first so so the so the first half is really fun as a guitar player. And the second half is really fun for a bass player. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, so so one night I was shredding the guitar like Joel Hoekstra, like Joel Hoekstra. <laughs> and the next night I was James Jamerson. It was just so much fun. And um Joel was had the good sense to keep it to keep it under wraps until the encore, you know, like the playoff. But he already had that eight finger thing completely down. It was it was already a blue, a really mind blowing, incredibly fluid, fully evolved technique. It was beautiful to watch. Now I can't <laughs> I can't do that, but we'll get to that later. So we, we struck up. So we struck up a friendship. Where did uh, did that did you and Joel Joel work on anything else after that together? Uh, yeah, I was in a band called the Turtles. He wound yeah. up coming in and playing bass for that, and then I uh, and then I wound up um, then I wound up subbing out of that gig to do other stuff. And he came in and subbed for me, 
And uh, so there was a little bit of musical chairs there. We're, some, we're, we're, sometimes we were in that band together, and sometimes he was me. And uh, so See. that's that, that's that's kind of how that went. And then I just left the country for a while. I got I, I got a call from Cirque du Soleil. Okay. Wow. Now. So well, I, I did I did something, you know, I did something called Van Helsing's Curse for D. Snyder. Mm. It's kind of kind of like. Uh, no, wait, I did I did Trans-Siberian Orchestra, 2003. I did East Coast, 2003. Then I did uh, Van Helsing's Curse. And then I was, then I toured the world with Cirque du Soleil and had it, brought my family and had another baby on the road. Wow. Born in Perth. Yeah, so it was, it was a pretty wild ride. <laughs> How I, ran, I, mean, Joe, I literally ran away with the circus. When, when Joel was telling us his story, he was talking about subbing in for a guy with turtles and went and that's you that's pretty cool how it comes full circle yeah, yeah. he and the bass he subbed in on bass too yeah well i think so that's he, what he was he was yeah. he was me in love janice you know it was, <laughs> was kind of like we, we kind of swapped ends that's pretty cool which is pretty cool yeah and he's like awesome guy no ego about anything did the turtles and trans-siberian orchestra did those overlap at all uh, no, not really, because I wasn't really doing the turtles that much anymore. I kind of okay. moved on, and also, also Trans Siberian is it's a short run. Yeah, so, it's only it's only three. It's uh, it's it's only three months. When I was doing it, actually, it was only two. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you were growing. when you when you were doing Trans Siberian Orchestra, and then you know the months that they weren't doing that, you were doing you know the musical theater. Was there one that you preferred over the other? I mean, you know, because in musical theater, you're not really the center of attention, whereas, you know, if you're in Trans-Siberian Orchestra, you're more of the center of attention. Was there one that you liked more than the other, or was there pros to both? First of all, at Trans-Siberian Orchestra, you're not the center of attention. <laughs> no. I'd look out, and I would see this. People looking yeah. at the light show. Okay. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's like a kiss show, you know. It's a, on, it's a on steroids. Bit, a little bit. You're a small. You, you have a couple of solo spots, but they're very scripted. You play exactly what's on the record. Although I did get there was there was a new number, and then I did get to compose my own solo, and I wound up playing on the record. I'm, that's me playing on Christmas Cannon Rock. Okay. Uh, at that point, it was a new number. It hadn't been recorded, so I got to come up with my own solo. Cool. So, I, I had a couple of spotlights, but for the most part, you're 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 a small cog in a big machine. And the, the show is the star, and it's very like musical theater that way. In musical theater, the show is the star. It doesn't matter what it looks like. And I've been hired for stuff where I'm, uh, I mean, I did Rock of Ages in Toronto, and the first thing that I come out is I go up, come out alone, and I terrify the audience with a tapping solo. <laughs> but you're still, but, but you're still, um, no matter how it looks, the show is the star. I actually did a video about this on my own YouTube channel, which is, it's YouTube dot com slash Tristan Avakian. Uh, that's one one word. And it's called uh, Musical Theater for Rock Guitarists. And I go into a lot of this in detail. Basically what's required. There's definitely more to it than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. When uh... if you want to put a link in the description or something, that's like I, I get I go yeah. I go into it in, in great deal. All in, right. in a great deal of detail. It's not for everyone, let's put it that way. And I will even try to put the link on the screen as we talk right here because I know you can do that, but I've never done it. So uh, <laughs> that will. So if it's there, click it. If it's not, um, uh, hey, uh, I'll put it somewhere else. It'll uh, be over my face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but you did. You said you toured with the the, the circus for two years. Now was uh, was that all over the world? The, the United States. Uh, uh, some stuff in North America, but it was mostly it was New Zealand, Australia, and Pacific Rim, like Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Oh man! And I also went to Dubai. All right. Oh. It's about two uh, and a half. Years. All right. And were you? What was your job there? Were you just guitars only, or were you were you uh, in charge of any musical direction? No, there was an MD, very capable MD, named Jim Bevan. And I was solely a guitarist. It was mostly, it was the gig was mostly rhythm. The original guitarist was uh, Robin Fink from Nine Inch Nails. Okay. So some of it was pretty heavy. Some of it was pretty aggressive. And I and I had an onstage spot. Uh, I, I had a, I, I had like a bit with a violin bow actually. 
Now, what year would would have would would the the circus gig end? What where are we at time wise with that? Now we're now we're in two thousand five. Okay, so did did the circus gig end because you wanted to go to something else? Uh, was that show just ending? I mean, why? It, it ended. I, it, I I ended it. Okay. Basically, what happened was my daughter was waking up in the middle of the night and crying. Mm-hmm. And I would say, I'd say to her, sweetie, what's wrong? And she'd be like, oh, I don't want to travel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day she, it was heartbreaking. And the next day she couldn't remember it. But I was at that point, I was like, this is, that's it. I'm out. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I sent her, I, I sent, I sent her mom home with the kids home to New York. And I started looking for the exits. And one thing, the, the next thing that happened was she moved back. She's, she, she's, my now ex-wife is Canadian. She moved back to Canada because work in New York dried up. She was having a really hard time breaking back in. And her agent, she was, she, she's an actress. Her agent was like, come on up, you know, I'll get you plenty of auditions. So she went up there and as fate would have it, we were going to play a casino, uh, sir, the show was called Kidam. We were scheduled to play. A, a sit down. They sit down. The shows. These shows sit down for six to eight weeks in each city. We were scheduled to sit down in Biloxi in a casino for a month and a half. Hurricane Katrina came along and wiped it out. The venue literally got washed into the Gulf. Yeah. So they put us on leave on 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 paid leave for for two months. They sent us home with half pay, which was a pretty good deal. And while I was there, I auditioned for a musical called We Will Rock You. Just based on the music of Queen. I auditioned for Brian May and Roger Taylor, and I got in. I got the job. And that wow. started my life in Canada. So you audition, the audition was in Canada for that? Yeah. Okay. So how, when you, when you, uh, when you auditioned for that, were, how familiar were you with Queen? Were you an avid fan or just a fan in passing? Uh, Here's the thing. It's like, once again, there's that Venn diagram, right? And there was a big area where what, you know, like like my life experience and my f- skill set overlapped with that music. But I never studied it. I never played a Queen cover in my life. But for some reason, like at Soundcheck, I would very often play the solo from Killer Queen just to, just to make sure everything was right. Like, you know, that my, mm-hmm. that my amp sound was good. And <clears throat> for some reason, I always gravitated towards that. And then the next thing I know, there, there I was playing in front of him. Now that's got to be yeah. uh, uh, terrifying. Yes. I guess it would be a little intimidating, right? Um, it was a little intimidating, but here's what I did. Uh, first of all, I over prepare like a son of a bitch. That's my kung fu. <laughs> I I take the material when I get a hold of the materials, I go over it and over it and over it till I'm blue in the face, till I'm sick of it. And that's like that's never going to happen with Queen. I never really get sick of it. That's one of the wonderful things about that music. But uh, here's what I did. And I've never told anybody this story before. I I took went through my kids' Legos and I took four little Lego men and I called them Queen. And I think Freddie was a little ghost and I gave him a crown <laughs> and a cape. And I put them in front of me like while I was practicing, put them in front of my laptop while I was going while I was while I was working up while I was working up the stuff. And because I knew that day. Like if I stu- if I was gonna I felt like I was gonna choke, all I'd have to do is look at them, look at Roger and Brian, and imagine those Legos, and I would crack up laughing. Oh my god! <laughs> and it was just great. a spell, it, and 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 it worked. That's awesome. And uh, is is the legend true that Brian May is probably one of the nicest guys in the business? That's what I've always heard. Absolutely, he's, he's Absolutely. such a sweet guy. He's the, just the best, and we're friends to this day. Now. Uh... A side uh, question: um, If if it was Dire Straits and I said Tristan, <laughs> we need to get a hold of Brian May right now. How long would it take for you to get in contact <laughs> with him? Can you beat Brandon Etheridge's record? It depends on what you call Dire Straits. I mean, if it was Mark Knopfler, I would think that he'd be able to call him up himself. <laughs> yeah. I was waiting for that to come. Wow, I didn't even, didn't even see that one coming. I'm yeah. Like, He's a busy man. Yeah, but, uh, he's, he's a he's a busy man, and he doesn't always respond right away. Yeah, we we asked that question to Brandon on the episode with him, and he's like, "I could 
it'd probably take 24 hours, but we could get in contact with him. I was wondering if if you could beat the uh, 24 hour mark. He said uh, he said Roger Taylor was a little bit more elusive yeah. than. Uh, yeah, I don't even have Roger's email address, and I worked. Yeah. I was I was in his band. I was in uh, <laughs> I was in Phoenix Travaganza. I worked with him in pre pro for two, for two weeks, and uh, I, I can. I can get a hold of his handler. Mm-hmm. I can get a hold of Justine, but I can't. Ro- Roger never gave out his personal information. Now, um, so Brian's a lot. More, Brian's a lot more accessible. I guess also Brandon gave us the uh, advice to also include something about astronomy, and maybe the answer would come back a little bit quicker um, with uh, with Brian May from uh, from We Will Rock You. Uh, does that then go to? Uh, were you working with Brandon during that We Will Rock? Yeah, not, not in that not in that production. He had worked on another production in uh, in Austria, in Germany. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he worked on the German he worked on the German production. Okay. And I and I worked on the Toronto production. We actually came together on Queen Extravaganza, which was the 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 Queen tribute that was mm-hmm. put together by Roger. We were um, um, we we were both selected to to be in that band, so that's where that's where I met him. Where, well, were you doing the "We Will Rock You" musical when your uh, adventure with Night Ranger began? No, I was doing Rock of Ages. Okay, so uh, it, did it go from "We Will Rock You" to Rock of Ages? Is that it did. okay? Now, where yeah. when you were doing the Rock of Ages, was that the uh, were you doing a Canadian version or were you doing an American version with Joel or Canadian version? Okay. I basically was Joel in that. I was I was Joel in in Rock of Ages. Okay, so he's doing the American yeah, and give me a wig. <laughs> yeah, I think, did you do the hair flip? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you're. I was, doing... I, had done, I had done I had done the Toronto Wheel Rocky, then I did the Italian one, and then after when I got home from Italy, I went right into the Rock of Ages, the Canadian Rock of Ages. Mm-hmm. So you're doing the Rock of Ages, uh, and uh, you, obviously we're going to go into the Night Ranger uh, realm of things. But had you had you subbed for any other rock bands before, similar to Night Ranger, before you you know before you do the uh, Night Ranger gig? No, not really. Okay. It was it was it was uh, that was the first. All right. So how does the Night Ranger experience, uh, how does that start with you? Is it a phone call from Joel, from their management? How does something like that start? Well, it's a funny thing because it started with Trans-Siberian. Trans-Siberian called me up, and uh, I, I, I was a one-year guy. I was basically filling in for Alex. and But Alex wanted to leave, so they called me up and they asked me if I wanted to come back. And I was doing Rock of Ages, so I said, "Yeah, possibly. Why don't I just talk to? Uh, why don't I? Why don't I just talk to? Well, the the, the MD of Rock of Ages mm-hmm. because it would have been a substantial commitment. I would have had to leave for leave the show for three months. You know, why don't I just ask him and get back to you? So then, when I got off the call, I guess they went, "Wait a minute, Rock of Ages. Who's doing it on Broadway? Why don't we get the Broadway guy?" So I figured this out later because they, because the follow up call never came and then I was then then um, I was talking to Joel and I found out they'd offered it to him and I was like wait a minute I'll tell you how to do this because I'd been through it with him before turned down the first offer turned down the second offer maybe take the third offer but whatever you do there. Whatever you do, remember they're lowballing you. Hold out for more. <laughs> so I, I I I touched base with him later, and I was like, "How did you do?" And he was like, "Yeah, I did all right." <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, it didn't occur to them that we were friends. Yeah, yeah. So that so that gave me some small measure of satisfaction. <laughs> I don't know if it's, I should even that should even be in here, but well, um, well, we'll let you uh, we'll let you think about it. And... <laughs> Anyway, so Joel got the Joel got the Trans Siberian gig, and then of course he had to have a necessary conversation with Night Ranger because he was, you know, pretty much a full member. Yeah. And that was, but, but by that time Trans Siberian had really blown up. I mean, it was like three times what it was when I was doing it, as far as like 
the as far as the length of time commitment and also the kind of venues that were playing, everything had tripled. So it was a really serious commitment. So he had to go back to them and say, "Hey guys, I got this thing. It's you know, it's only a few months a year. It's I know it's I know I'm in this band, but it's something I really want to do." And he talked them into accepting a sub for uh, for for those few months of the year that he was out doing Trans Siberian, and that happened to be me because I was him and I was him in Rock of Ages, and uh, and I'd done a little bit of this and that. So they went, "Yeah, yeah, okay." So was uh, was it an, a prospect that you were excited to do? I mean, was this like the first? Because you've been doing mainly theater for years up to that point. Uh, was 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 you excited to be able to kind of be back into a a band experience, or did you just look at it as a uh, another gig? Yes, I was absolutely very excited about it. It was really it was because. Well, musical musical theater and rock are strange bedfellows, and you know, like I said, no matter how it looks to the audience, it's a very, very different animal. And it was I was really excited about getting out and playing with a rock and roll band again, and at a very high level. I mean, like a band with hits and just some monstrous playing. I mean, I always I'd always been a fan uh, of of Brad Gillis. I mean, from even before from Night Ranger, like I he came up on my radar with Ozzy, which is of course where he came up on everybody's radar. Yep. It was like, yeah. Wow. This guy was doing stuff with a whammy bar that like nobody had ever heard of. It, it was like, it was incendiary and really, really influential. I mean, no him, no time back Daryl and no a lot of other things either. Right. He was like the Jeff Beck of pop metal. So, uh, so I was, I was really excited about it. Yeah. I was jazzed. Well, you knew sister Christian already. So you had that going for you. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I, yeah, I knew. Uh, I, I knew one song. I was like, hey, let's do that one again. <laughs> I got it. Um, they could have changed the lyrics to Brother Tristan. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Brother Tristan, all the time has come. Uh, well, the time is yes, the time yeah. indeed had come. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I knew, I was like, I, I was, I was in, I was in Brad's room, and we were going over the harmonies. So before like the day before the gig, I there was no rehearsal. There was one day. Did they did they send you uh, any? Did they send you any soundboards or anything that you could woodshed before you? Uh, I had a lot. I had a lot of materials. Joel hooked me up. Okay. Joel told them, "Don't worry, this guy's this guy's on the ball. He's really conscientious, and I'm gonna I'm gonna train him." So Joel trained me over Skype. Okay. So we're looking at October 2010 when you first first joined him. Do you remember? You, you talk about that first experience. You just mentioned that you were like the day before were with Brad. Yeah. I went up to Brad's room and just, you know, just unplugged in the air. We went over the harmonies and he was obviously really nervous. I mean, he's, he's a band guy, right? And night ranger is like his band. The idea of somebody subbing out is just to begin with kind of freaked him out. It was really alien to him. And, uh, you know, respect. I mean, he took the money he made from Ozzy and put it into their first record. That's like his band. Yeah. And so somebody calling out to do another gig or already was like, <laughs> you know, mm, sure. Yeah. But what, you know, once, once he was assured that I'd done my homework, then he was like, Phew. and uh, it was a really interesting experience just as, just as a guitar player, because I'm going to get into a little bit of guitar geekery here. Um, he had the strat with him, the red strat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you could see that it was, uh, it, it, it's, the, I think the body is, it's a 50 <laughs> strat, it's an ash body. I got to pick it up, it was very lightweight. And you could see because of the wear, the finish is so worn, you could see the wood underneath, and the rings are very widely spaced. Uh, this is a light guitar, there's a lot of air in it. So it's incredibly resonant, it just rings like a bell. It's almost like a it's it's almost like a semi hollow that way. Acoustically, it's loud and very and very bright, and it has a lot of body and sustain. So all that stuff that he's doing with a whammy bar, he uses a lot of gain live, and that stuff is helping him. But just unplugged, just in the air, when he does one of those crazy whammy harmonic things, it's it is clear as a bell. Really? Oh, yeah. Man. He really he's not relying on gain. He's not relying on volume or on effects. That stuff is coming from his hands and from that guitar. And, uh, you know, wow, respect, you know, when you, cause that's really, that's really the test of any guitarist mm -hmm. and particularly with a lot of rock guitarists, man, you take away, 
you take away the gain and everything, and they just fall apart. They just fold. Now we... and you, can hear, you can really you can really hear how even if they're impressive live, you can really hear how sloppy they are. Not Brad. Mm. Yeah. Brad, you... Brad is you know even without all that stuff is one hundred percent Brad. All that stuff that you're hearing is coming out of his hands. When you were woodshedding and and learning all those parts, what was your uh, was there anything because you're learning all of Jeff Watson's the original yeah. guitarist uh, you're learning all his parts was there anything that you can remember that you were learning and it just kind of blew you away like what in the fuck was he doing here oh my god yes well it did even when 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 I was younger you know when I was a kid and I was seeing their videos on MTV like I, I saw the eight finger thing and I was like mm -hmm. what are you doing in the middle of this pop tune all of a sudden it's you know yeah this thing happens and it's it's like uh, it's he, the guy is the guy is the guy is like three Van Halens, <laughs> and the alternate picking stuff is incredibly clean. And there's there's two kinds of guitar, of, of rock guitar players, right? There's there's Strat guys and Les Paul guys, and he's more yeah. of a Les Paul guy. He's got a stop tail piece. His alternate picking is really clean. I'm more of a Strat guy. I'm actually a lot more like Gillis. I do a lot of legato. I do a lot of whammy bar stuff. So it was a real challenge coming up to that level because Jeff Watson is really like a fusion guy in a pop band. Wow. He's doing uh, not only the eight finger tapping, but also his harmonic concepts. He's superimposing uh, upper structure triads over the root. He's playing grouping like odd. He's, he's playing like uh, odd number triplet groupings. He's uh, v super fast and clean. He's like a, he's like a very advanced player, like a very advanced fusion player in a pop band. And it was it was really it was really really difficult. Well, well, I'll I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, can you hear this? Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. I'll turn it up a little. <laughs> I worked out some things with tapping, because I was like, I'm only going to do a handful of gigs with these guys. There's and there's 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 no way I'm going to get this together in time. So. Um, Like in Don't Tell Me You Love Me, I yeah. worked that out tapping. And Gillis just looked at me like. <laughs> and I was like, because because Joel told me it was it was it was okay. It was like, well, that's what Reb used to do. Because Reb yeah. had sucked in right. for me. And uh it turned out that that's one of the reasons why Reb wasn't there anymore, because Brad hated that. Ah. <laughs> so he was like he 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 was he was like no you know what you got to do get it together so I got it together I got it together by the next day and it was hard it was. Hey. Let me let me get let me yeah, get that. Yeah, I was gonna say lower. Yeah. There we go. I can't play. This will kill my hands right now because I got to work my way up to it. You can tell even slow that it's a different animal than doing this. So he was right. He was absolutely right. It's like it's it's you got to go big with that stuff. You got to you got to come correct or go home. So I did. I got it together. The other thing that was really challenging was the eight finger tapping. Like I said, Joel was had the advantage there because he'd already been doing it for years and doing it really, really well at a very high level. And he could whip it out at a moment's notice and it fit right in and it was in time and it sounded musical and clean. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Uh, so I worked at, I, I worked. I, I did as best as I could with a uh, little string skipping. There's um, that's a technique that's that sounds a little bit like it sounds a little bit like tapping multiple notes on one string. Um, I'll, I'll illustrate. It's you're, what you're doing is you're 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 tapping along one open string, then you hammer on. And add a tap on top of that. So I'm not playing. I'm not playing a Night Ranger song right now. I, I don't remember that in that stuff. It's yeah. There's, yeah. But um. So I would throw. So so I work out things that way, with uh, like, like string like string skipping tapping sequences. Mm -hmm. Or I would take two fingers. You know, I couldn't get all four going. But I'd stick a pick in my mouth and get two fingers going like. And they would get the idea. 
I mean, I knew that I, I, I knew I knew, I knew that Brad still wasn't 100 percent happy. I mean, he missed his boy, but it was uh, I got I got through it that way. I, you know, I, I can't questions. do the eight. I can't do the eight, but I can do six and a half. Yeah. Nobody, nobody does six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions regarding that. Uh, a, can Brad do the eight finger technique? And B, why why is does the eight finger what, what makes it difficult? I, I I mean, I'm a drummer. I can't. I can't even play a good. I song can't play with two fingers. Well, like, Brad's, oh. Brad's got his own thing, and that's what was great about Night Ranger was that they is is that each was there were there were not one but two mind blowing guitarists, and each mm -hmm. each of them had completely their own thing. Brad doesn't have to do that because he's Brad, and because yeah. he had Jeff. He does this. He, he had he, that that was that was what made it such an incredible like high wire circus act is because. This guy's look what he's doing, and now this guy look yeah. what he's doing. Right, look over there. Both, if they were both doing the same thing, I don't think it would be as interesting. It's like fire and ice, you know what I mean? It's like uh, it's the, the quote Spinal Tap. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I, I remember warm water. <laughs> I remember all the, kid, the kids at school, the guitar players would always there would always be the debate who's better between Jeff or Brad, and you know the the sophisticated guitar players would say, "Oh, it's Jeff, it's Jeff," and you know. And the showman would say, "Oh no, it's Brad. It's Brad." You and know? it's because they they couldn't play like Brad. You know, they, they none of them could bend a string like Brad or use. A, well, the only thing they could do is they could hold a guitar by the whammy bar. That's the only yeah. thing they could do. They would do the Eddie Van Halen Elf at you know Screech. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's kind of a fun thing to do. When it's it's um, you know, for anybody who's interested in cultivating that, take one take one note and play a melody. You know. Uh, just a, any melody, yeah. Somewhere over the rainbow is a good one. Yeah. Try to see how much mileage you can get out of one note just with the whammy bar. It's a really good exercise. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, it's apples and oranges. I mean, they've each got their own thing. Yeah. Do you remember where your first show was? Oh God, no. I, I would have to look at the day sheets. All right. As a... They're all they're all they're all in my they're all in my emails. I I said I know I said I was going to look at them and then I just kind of didn't. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, it's just you know us being non professional musicians, we all think yeah. If Night Ranger called us and asked us to play, we would know. Yeah, it was uh, October 10th in uh, uh, you know Des Moines, Iowa, or something. So I think I think my mind was probably mush from learning <laughs> just from cramming the stuff, and just because of the tension. But I remember if if it wasn't the first one, it was one of the first ones. It was a, it was a radio station party with Skid Row, and I remember thinking, "Man, I'm playing with, I'm on the bill with Skid Row. This is awesome. This is amazing." Yeah, it was like it was like my juvenile fantasy coming through. <laughs> wow. Do you remember? I mean, I know you obviously don't remember the location, but do you remember the first show? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, no. What? I was probably, I was, I was, I was probably too terrified. Okay. Now. <laughs> Were you again? This is October two thousand ten. Was it mainly like? Uh, was it mainly like every other every weekend? Were you performing? It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't like a uh, a bus it tour. Call, it was what, like what they call fly dates. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like weekends, and there'll be maybe a, 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 a string of of two or three. Mm -hmm. But there was no tour bus or anything like that. There were like yeah. there were fly dates. You fly in and fly out. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, did you gravitate to anyone in the band? I mean, you know, did uh, did you, you know, did you gravitate more towards Kelly, or did you kind of keep to yourself, or did Eric Kelly like... is the biggest sweetheart in the world. <laughs> he is the nicest man. He was so nice to me. He made me feel so welcome. Like I said, you know, Brad had mixed feelings about the whole thing, and uh, and and Jack is Jack is kind of Jack. Jack is like on 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 planet Jack. He's like doing, he's doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And he's like, as, as long as he knows that you're cool, that you're going to make your call time and you know what, you, you know what you're to do. Then, you know, yeah. And then, then fine. He doesn't need to focus on you. Like he's, he's just doing his thing. Kelly was just the nicest guy. And Todd, uh, rest in peace. That I, I absolutely love that man. Mm -hmm. uh, he was so, uh, he was so good to me. Uh, and that's and I, I, I really miss him. And He's Eric, nice guy. Eric uh, Levy, I remember when we had him on, said the same thing. It seems like everybody that uh, 
everyone that came in contact with him, and I only met him once or twice, and it was both brief, but everybody that seems to have met him and spent time with him, um, they all say uh, the same thing and all say uh, kind words. When you first... Tom was the best best tour manager I've ever worked with and just the nicest guy. He's really missed. Really? That's some, Eric was uh, awesome too. Doesn't uh, say much, but heavy, heavy <laughs> position and really sweet guy. Now, and so was Christian. Christian was super nice. Yeah, too. that's what I was going to ask. Christian was the keyboardist the first when time. First came, yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, so you play these these fly-in dates for 2010, uh, and then probably if if Jules doing. Uh, Trans Siberian Orchestra probably till a little bit after the first of the year of 2011. Do you uh, do you remember? You know, is there anything that sticks out from that first stint that you did? Um, I know you said something about Skid Row. Brent, you're going to have to disconnect your mic, man. Who is that? That's Brent's mic. What, what is it doing? It's it's doing that thing where it sounds like there's a damn truck going through yeah. your house. Well, Todd Todd had had, had uh, Todd certainly had a um, a line on the on the local shoe model establishment in town. You know, wherever we were going, he already had he already had that advanced. But I, I I'm taking the fifth on that one. <laughs> um. So when, that, that was that was that was a, a couple of those experiences were memorable. He would find one of these joints like out in the middle of nowhere. It would be like incredible. I, I don't know how he did it. I think just experience, yeah. experience and dedication. Yeah, that's awesome. So and also also uh, when we played, we played uh, Harrow's in Reno. There was um, it was Brad's birthday, and he had a lot of friends come along, and they treated us like kings. We already had a we already had a buyout for food, and then they threw him this dinner. It was just incredible. It was filet mignon, and oh my god, I it was it was like it was like they were trying to kill us with food. I'll take that. And I I had to wake up the next morning and hike around the lake just to just walk it off. But it was that was an incredible experience too. It was a really beautiful setting. I like when I do when I do fly-ins like that. I always like to 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 wake up in the morning and do like whatever the nature thing is. Mm-hmm. I don't drink or anything like that. It's it's um like I, I kind of like to if it's someplace interesting or beautiful, I kind of like to go and just dig where I am. Yeah. So that was one of the good ones, just because of the settings. It was I'm not really really a big casino person. They take care of you and everything, but it's yeah. not like I don't gamble or anything. You just give I, away your money. Yeah, yeah, life is enough of a gamble. <laughs> um, do you? Uh, so that first stint ends. Do you? Uh, do, are you th- are you even on the radar that hey, the next season next year when tr- uh, Joel possibly does this again, I may get the opportunity to do this again. Is that even on your radar? Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, it's, at that point, um, I think at that point they were uh, they were looking for a. They, I did it the following year, and then after that, I think they wanted a permanent replacement, and they wanted to get their own guy. Mm-hmm. So you. So, um, uh, so they did, and at that point, I at that point I had already, uh, I think I had already gotten the Queen Extravaganza gig anyway. Right. So you, uh, but you go back for that second stint, which would probably have been you know October of eleven, to uh, to January of two thousand and and twelve. Uh, then this would have been your stint with uh, Eric Levy on keyboards. Uh, what what was it like? When, was there anything different the second time around? Where you know where you know you're 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 not the yeah you're the new guy, but they're hey we 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 you know we've played shows with you the year before, and mm-hmm. was there any difference in the the atmosphere? Were uh, just anything what was that second time around do you remember anything being different or you know was you was you enjoying it more because you're taking it all in maybe your mind wasn't as much mush i might have been enjoying it a little bit too much 
actually. And what do you mean by that? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I might have gotten a little bit comfortable. I might have gotten a little bit too comfortable on stage. I might have been flashing about a bit too much. Ah. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's, def there's definitely a boundary there. Like, if, mm -hmm. like I, I was, uh, um, I was a sub. So, but sometimes I forgot I was a sub, and I was just in a rock and roll band playing and having a great time. And sometimes that didn't, honestly, that didn't go over too well. Like an unwritten rule or something like that. You have yeah, it's an unwritten rule. Okay. Uh, it's an unwritten. It's, it's kind of an unwritten rule. Yeah. And definitely, I think it would be hard because you know you are up on stage. You're a guitarist. You're playing all these great licks. You got great crowds. I would think it would be hard to uh, to pull back. Uh, but uh, I understand what you're saying. Did they ever say anything to you, or it was just something that you just are thinking, maybe looking back, that yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I mean, was there was it ever anything that you know? Brad yeah, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take the fifth on that. <laughs> I'm gonna take the fifth. So, uh, so did you? I mean, do you looking back, did you have uh, any favorite? tracks you enjoyed playing more than others was there yeah i love doing that dual guitar thing uh on uh on don't tell me you love me that was a lot of all right uh that was, that was a high point uh, you could still rock in america it was a lot of fun too i mean it's it's just it's such a rush it's so exhilarating you just can't uh, you, you just can't help get caught up in it it's really exhilarating did being in this you know night ranger this band did it make you uh think hey maybe instead of the uh, musical theater maybe i should uh uh you did it make you want to join make your own create your own band or go down the path that kind of jewel was taken which led you to because you weren't in the queen experience or the uh queen extravaganza yet correct well here's the thing uh joel does it so well that almost nobody else has to <laughs> he's kind of got it covered you know what i mean there's no point in me doing what here's the ironic thing is it's, there's no point in me doing what he does because he's already doing it so well <laughs> well what i guess what i meant was you know joel is he kind of gotten out of musical theater went to night ranger and then you know eventually white snake was mm -hmm. in where you did was that you playing with night ranger a it was it something you considered like hey i i want to not be in theater, but I want to, you know, be in a band experience again. Did that ignite any fires or was that something that was already there or something that came later? Well, certainly if it, if another opportunity had come along, I, I, I would have pursued it, but I also, but I had other stuff going on mm -hmm. and there was, um, it's the musical theater thing, um, kind of escalated. I mean, they kept calling me for stuff. I went on to do I went on to do Book of Mormon and Kinky Boots and uh, the, the Bodyguard and like a, another another production of of Wheel of Rock You. I mean, the work just kept coming. Book of Mormon is fantastically wrong. It is fantastic. It was probably, that's probably as far as musical theater goes. That's probably my favorite show that I've ever done. There was lines in it that cracked me up every night. It's if you have not seen it, it is it will blow your mind. Yeah, I love Matt and Trey. They are fantastic. Yeah, there was stuff that cracked me up every night. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was so much fun to play. Like every song was like three songs. Every song was like there was there was one number that went from like um big band swing to Metallica. <laughs> and there was stuff there was stuff that was like there were there were like Disney show tunes and yeah, Afro it's... pop like like Afrobeat. Like it was just all over the map stylistically. And, it's uh, insane. It is vulgar. So it's fun. it's the best. It was so much fun. When you, uh, when you, and then I started working with Mark again, you know, and, and that's, that's like, we, we, we play, we play, uh, we, well, before COVID, we've been moving, we've been mm -hmm. moving into arenas, we've been doing extended tours, and we play like a lot of the same rooms that Night Ranger plays, so yeah. I don't really miss anything. And it's a band experience, you know, it's a band experience more than the musical words, uh, was, uh, Queen Extravaganza, that's where you first started working with Mark Martell, right? Yeah. That's where Mark and, and Brandon and I all met. Okay, so did you have to audition again for Brian and Roger, or did they kind of already have your eyes, their eyes on you since you'd already, you know, been in the uh, We Will Rock You? 
Well, here's the thing. I, when I first heard about it, I looked into it. I was, I was definitely interested. But there were these online auditions that anybody in the world could vote on. And it was really like an appalling prospect. Because, I mean, you know, it's, you, you know from your, you guys are YouTubers yourself. It's like the comments section. It's just hell. It's the seventh circle of hell. Anybody could say anything that they want about you. It's brutal. So the idea that I was the idea that I'd have to like put together audition videos and that anybody could vote on it and anybody could say anything that they wanted, like about what I've spent all my life doing, <laughs> was just, just taking a crap on you. So uh, I, I, I said that I, I told the story in the guitar players in isolation video, but I'll just repeat it because it's a good one. I sent Brian an email saying basically, you know, do I have to do I have to do this? And he said, "I'm going to do an impersonation." It was email. It was email, but yeah. this, uh, this is just kind of how I visualize it. Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's Roger's thing, and that's the way. That's how he wants to do it. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid so. <laughs> so I bit the bullet, and I did the I did the on the online auditions, and I I won fair and square. I I didn't have any advantages. As a matter of fact. Having done Wheel Rocky was a strike against me <laughs> because Roger, because it's more Brian's thing. And Queen Stravaganza was Roger's thing, and he didn't want any of Brian's guys. Oh. He wanted to find his own guys. So I, if anything, I had, I had to go a little harder. Hmm. And then Queen Extravaganza kind of uh, morphs into ultimate queen celebration correct yeah well i basically um i had a scheduling conflict with uh, the rock of ages tour queen extravaganza had been postponing the tour over and over again and i was under contract with them so i couldn't take another gig but in the meantime i was going broke <laughs> and i have i had a family to support so uh, Rock of Ages tour came up and uh, and they just told me, go ahead, go, you know, take it. So uh, we'll 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 hook you up with something else down the line. So they hooked me up with um, the Queen, hooked me up with the Wheel of Rocky with the North American tour later, which was nice of them. Mm -hmm. They could have just said, all right, you know, on your bike, son. Sure. Yeah. But they hooked me up with it. They hooked me up with another gig later on. Now, um Later on, um, Brandon had a scheduling conflict. And then after that, Mark had a scheduling conflict. So we all kind of reconnected, like, like, at, like after we had left Queen Extravaganza. And they, then, then it was a new thing. Basically, I think Mark had been, had been looking to do, to do it on his own for some time. Anyway, and it was just kind of serendipity. Yeah. We were all available, and uh, and and there were dates. There were already a string of dates. That was that a, pro a promoter had already booked a string of dates, and with a, with a Brazilian Queen tribute. Long story short is they didn't have their shit together. They didn't get their work permit. So a week before, they had to pull out, and this promoter had all these venues booked, and no Queen tribute. <laughs> So he got hold of Mark, and then uh, let me see. I think it was Angus Angus Clark from Trans Siberian um, was called, and the first date was Can is Canada. And he just told them, "Why don't you just call Tristan? He's the Queen guy, and he's already up there." First gig was at the Rose in Brampton, which is like forty minutes away from here. So just call him. So they called me. I called Brandon, and then, were, then there we were all together again, and it was like we never left. We all knew what to do. It sounded amazing immediately, and we were just off to the races. And and that's what you that's what you were working on before COVID hit, correct? And yeah, we were up to about sixty, seventy dates a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm also uh, I'm also the lead guitarist in a musical called Come From Away. The Canadian production had been running for, we were in our third year and we still had packed houses. 
so I was doing literally, I was, I had an eight show week with that. So I'd literally been working between that and Mark's band. I had literally mm -hmm. been working constantly for the previous two years. So I went from, I don't know, from 300 <laughs> dates a year to zero. In like overnight. And the ultimate queen celebration, I mean, that really uh, had been taking off because I know on the North American tour that you guys did, I might be a year off, but I think in 2018, you guys were playing some pretty big venues, you know, throughout the Midwest because I, me and Brandon had been talking. He was saying, you know, hey, I'll put you on the guest list or something like that. And mm -hmm. uh, the show that there was none near me, but uh, that's how I looked at the, you know, the schedule. I was like, damn, these are some pretty big uh, venues to be, you know, it, you don't think about a queen, you know, a queen, I guess you'll think about tribute band maybe playing those places, but I guess when you have a group like Queen and you have the talent of the performers playing, uh, it, yeah. it basically creates a, uh, a life of its own. And uh, I was just amazed. I would think you guys were playing uh, the arena in uh, Huntington, West Virginia. That was the closest one. And that is not a very uh, small place. So, uh we got we started building momentum uh around 2018 and then a couple of things happened well there were a couple of things that gave him as a tailwind for one thing mark was already famous he already had a huge viral video the fact that we performed on american idol for a third of the planet earth with queen didn't hurt it certainly gave us an imprimatur mm -hmm. and uh and then he booked the uh, he, he booked um bohemian rhapsody gave the movie uh he he Whenever they couldn't, whenever they couldn't find uh, stems of Freddie's voice, uh, Mark would sing. Really? And yeah, so he's there's there's a lot of Mark in that movie, and that's you know word the word got out. I think uh, I think the producer, I think the producer dropped that in a Rolling Stone interview, and it was the number one movie in the world. Mm -hmm. He he should have been in the movie. Well, the thing is, you know, Rami's a fine actor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've had people say that to me, like, oh, you should have played Brian. No, the guy that played Brian killed it. Yeah, he did. I know, I know Brian, and, he, like, he nailed it. And also, I was looking at his hands. He, he like, he did his homework. You know, acting is acting is a real gig, and I, res I respect it. There's, there's, I'm great if I'm playing guitar player, but the second <laughs> I have to open my mouth, it's over. Well, let, let me ask you about the movie. Uh, you know... Uh, Brian, and you know, I can only speak for myself. I mean, my, yeah. Mark might have killed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For all I, for all I know, but you know, it's it it went down the way it went down, and it certainly didn't hurt. When we when when COVID shut us down, we were playing uh, extended multi city tours in arenas that went on for months on end, like <laughs> all over the world. So you know, did they did the did the actors up. playing Roger and Brian? Did they? They have their mannerisms down really well. Was it? Was there scenes where it was kind of eerie seeing, seeing them portray Brian and Roger, and you um, knowing Ro them? Roger, I don't. Roger, I don't know as well. Although I worked with him very intensely on Queen Extravaganza. The guy that played Roger looked nothing like him, hmm. which kind of threw me off a little bit. But the guy who did Brian was amazing, amazing. And I was really surprised by the characterization too. The the Brian, Brian, the, the, the movie Brian is pretty salty. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad that I've never seen that side of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, an album I want to talk to you about is, uh, and you, it's an album you go by as your uh, artist name, As Waters. Uh, that came out, what, 2015? Am I, what year did that come out? Yeah, 15, 16. And I will post a link to the website thank you um, I, before all these interviews I all of us Brent and Andy and myself we will do our own research and um, I did not know about this album I came across it and uh, and I will just say this I'm very impressed with it uh, Thanks. it's it's not uh I mean, if you're going into it looking for, you know, Night Ranger, Midnight Madness, or if you're looking for a Journey record, you're not going to find that. Uh, it's it's not that type of record. Uh, 
but it's very the songwriting is yeah. is it's is very good. I was actually very impressed by your uh by your uh by your vocals uh and lyrically I was I was impressed as well. Uh Thank so you. was that something like when you're touring with Queen or whatever is that something you just are these songs you write on the road your time off you know where did that how did that album evolve well it's uh it's it's kind of a breakup album like uh like blood on the tracks or um it's and the reason the reason why it really bears no resemblance to the stuff that was previously my bread and butter like even the musical theater stuff that i was doing like we will rock you and rock of ages a lot of that is pretty much aor and there's a lot of really shreddy guitar. There's none of that on the album. And I think it's because it's kind of a correction. Everything that I was doing for a living was based on spectacle. And, uh, you know, and everything being in big hits and sexy costumes and everything super impressive. Mm-hmm. And so I naturally gravitated towards something on a far more intimate scale. Also, when I was touring with these various things, I had a nylon string guitar very much like this one it's a nylon is it's acoustic so you don't need to plug it in which is handy but it's unlike a steel it's kind of soft on the hands it doesn't beat up your hands you can play it for a long time without any fatigue i bought it to start working on my classical guitar but i wound up writing on it and all those songs basically came out of a guitar not this one it was a motif which had a full-size neck but a three-quarter size body so it would fit easy in the overhead of the bus right or a plane or anything i would just bring that up to my room and these songs just started coming out of it and maybe because they were coming out of an instrument of this type they've sort of i just sort of naturally gravitated towards certain genre towards certain genres like there's something on there's there's a bossa on there there's a civil warrior a ballad there's um there's like an elizabethan lay Celtic kind of thing, mm-hmm. and the lyric, the, uh, the 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 lyrics and the melodies got would sort of get pulled out of that soundscape. Just whatever whatever was going on in my life, and um, it surprised me um, as much as anybody because it was it's completely unlike anything that I've done before. And uh, there's kind of a thread weaving through it, but it goes through like a lot of different genres. It does. Uh... Like there's a thing on there that's like that's that's like Nelson it's like Frank Sinatra with Nelson Riddle. You know, that's, yeah, that's what's what's very funny is Hollywood. Um Hollywood ending, yeah. Yep. I kinda I, I could see that being like a crooner song, like you know, Frank Sinatra or something doing that. Uh yeah, and it's got a real kind of wallow shift for an arrangement. Like it was like like the arrangers of that period yeah. uh, had a big influence on me too. Lalo Schiffer and Henry Mancini. Nelson Riddle, again, and I did a lot of uh, my own arrangements. I, I had some help from Steve Weisberg, who's done some stuff with Marian Faithful and um, okay. Leonard Cohen. Uh, but it was, but but I did a lot of the arrangements myself, which yeah, was but, interesting too. But, but the, like I so said, the the album is an album that you'd put on, like if you're going to drink a pint, uh, and you know you're just wanting to. If you're in a mood, it's hard to describe. You listen to the album, you'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, like I said, it, it kind of weaves like uh, da- as a Dam Atlantis. Is that the the song? Uh, Dam Atlantis, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, like that was lyrically really good. It's one of those story. It's almost like one of those old drinking songs where they tell a story. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's, um, it's like what they used to call um, a lay, uh, which is get your mind out of the gutter. Uh, <laughs> it it was uh, something. Before, um, you know, troubadours would sing um, like story songs, mm-hmm. and we don't have. I got very interested in that. I got fascinated by that when I was on the road because maybe because I was a little bit of a troubadour myself. I was a traveling musician, and the, uh, uh, the they would fit lyrics to existing melodies. And there were, okay. there were story songs. And we, none of that stuff survives now because none of it was written down. None of it was notated. But there's some survival of it. I did some research on this, actually. Some, some of it survives in the work of John Dowland, who was a, uh, an English guitarist, a composer. 
and who you know who drew on that tradition for his uh, for for his pieces and it's also a lot of it wound up in Celtic music. Celtic music in its current form really started in the in the late 1800s, but it draws on a far older tradition. So there's a lot of that DNA in it. So I listened to some John Dowland, I listened to some Celtic music because I wanted I definitely wanted to evoke that era of like um you know uh like a, like a like an Elizabethan thing. And it, and it like and then you go to a song like Just Noise and it's got some horns on it. Like it could almost be like a Motown song if you arranged it that way. Uh, Bacharach. It's it's it's, it's a Bacharach homage. Uh, and then you talked about the album being you know a breakup album. You definitely hear that in Minneapolis. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that was Minneapolis. Like uh, that was so that was a dark night of the soul. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and you but you can hear it. I mean, I wrote you know slow. Uh, you know, a very moody, dark. The lyrics, you know, are are great on it. Uh, so you could definitely, you know, when you said it was a heart, you know, a breakup album, I was like, yeah, okay, I definitely heard that in that. that song. But then you get stuff uh, like Priceless. If you arrange it, I could see that being a Night Ranger song. Uh, you had a yeah, track. That's the closest thing. That that and Open Sky are the closest things to rock. <laughs> well, and Open I wrote Priceless and... for my daughter. Actually, that precedes that. that... That, that's the oldest song on the record, and I wrote it for my daughter, actually, when she was very small. And then I, I wrote An Open Sky was another one that I could see Night Ranger-ish. It's, it's kind of, it goes Night Ranger, and then you get a little bit of the Beatles in it. Uh, it's a psychedelic Beatles homage, yes. Yeah. It's a revolver homage. Uh, so, uh, anyway, and my favorite track was Amnesia. Um, but uh, But, yeah, anyways, I was just impressed with it, so I, you know, I think anybody that knows me from the page if there's something that i i enjoy uh, i will champion it and uh thanks man i will uh definitely put a link to that and i suggest just uh i'll put a link to the website but yeah go check it out if you're wanting something new and different uh yeah. and something uh that has a uh, what's the word i'm looking for a little bit of substance uh, to it, you just got to be in the right mood to listen to it. Don't if you're Saturday night and you're wanting to go party, that's probably not the you know the music to grab. But if you want, in a way, it kind of reminds me a little bit of maybe uh, Nebraska by Bruce Springsteen. You know, it's just a yeah. Uh, Thank you. Oh, that's a, that's high praise indeed. It's that type of album. So uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, Josh, you I don't, I'm sure you talked about when I had to walk away from it, my dog was going nuts outside the door here. So, but. Uh, the song um, was it engulf us? We reach for a star. That's the first yeah. track of the album. I know. I probably missed it. Um, that's beautiful, man. Thank you. I, I love. I was like, this song is great. Josh kind of, you know, Josh will send stuff out to us, and I was like, man, I'm listening to this. I'm just walking around the house with my earbuds on, and I stopped. I was like, what the heck am I listening to here? Thank so you. So I, I just, I wanted to at least tell you that song is really that's a cool song. Yeah, I heard it for the first time tonight as well. And my first thought was I didn't know who was singing it. And there's another guy up in Toronto named Bag. Do you know who that is by any chance? Oh. And it, it it reminded me, you, your voice reminded me of him a little bit. <coughs> um, but the guy's real eccentric. He'll, he'll sing a song about fucking a transvestite. And Easy. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> no, he, he just, he, it's just crazy eclectic songwriting. <laughs> But um, it was really good. Yeah, I, I had to. Yeah, if you whoever had fucking a transvestite on their bingo sheet just well, you, know, <laughs> you just won the you no, just, just took it, it off the. It's called there. the song. The song is called Mia Me I Amore. I'm so fucking horny. That's what the song's called. <laughs> and um, and it's it's got this whole flamenco thing going on, and and he's like, like fun, actually, yeah. but uh, yeah, and, horses as they say. <laughs> it's it just it's just out there, you know. You look it up. <laughs> write that down. Yeah, and, and and before you find it, I, uh, you're going to get about twenty pages you don't want to see. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Just the guy's name's Bag, and um, Put your it was one of the on. it was one of those Gene Simmons finds, and I just went ahead okay. and checked it out, and it was just nuts. So, uh, let's hey, let's uh. So are you, are you a Blue Jays fan? Uh, 
what a not really that sporty a guy. Although I got swept up in the Raptors thing. That was an incredible scene, man. Yeah. Like uh, when this this whole place just when when they when they won, man, this whole place just exploded. It just man, what incredible energy! Like it was just it was it was total madness. Yeah, uh, I like I said the only time I've ever been to Toronto, I didn't see Bag up there, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we went. We were doing a yeah, uh, you know, buddy of mine. This is years ago, doing a baseball trip. We went to Montreal, and then traveled down to uh, to Toronto. I originally thought the Sky Dome was the parking garage. Uh, Did you? Yeah, it's just a big concrete. Uh, yeah, yeah. Andy and I went in there during the <laughs> off season of baseball, and and I couldn't believe the turf. We, you yeah. know, it was all concrete under that turf, and we we went to the Hard Rock Cafe inside the Sky Dome, or whatever it's called now. All right, so we got the transvestite stuff out of the system. We good when we get onto the. <laughs> I threw out ba- baseball to get us back onto. Uh, I can, I can, I can send you the guys the track. It's, it's, it's so uh, that's okay. So Tristan, what does, uh, what does twenty twenty one or twenty? Yeah, is this what it is? Twenty twenty one. What? If, obviously, the pandemic controls everything, but uh, if that gets under control, what's the, uh, what's the plans? What's the goals? Uh, what's your next move? Well, Mark's got dates. Uh, a lot of the dates got moved. And a lot of them will probably get moved again. Uh, come from away is going to come back. I mean, the, the producers committed to it. Mm-hmm. What's that about? It's about actually, it's a really interesting story. Uh, speaking of which, like I said, a lot of the stuff that I've done in the musical theater was kind of based on spectacle. It's what I what I like to call hits, tits, and glitz, right? <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. Yeah, I mean it's sophisticated. This is this is like this this I mean not not everything that I've done is that way. And I don't put it down because those shows are a lot of fun to do. But this is about it's based on real events uh on it's it's people call it a 9/11 musical, but it's really a 9/12 musical. The um all, a, a lot of the, a lot of the planes crossing the Atlantic were prevented from entering American airspace and they had to land in Gander, Newfoundland. Right. So it's about how this sleepy town, which time had basically forgotten, they just happened to have a big airport because that's where planes used to stop before they got big enough to hold enough fuel to make transatlantic flights from the U.S. They used to, they used to stop. It was the farthest point where they could stop in, in North America to refuel. But it, time, it, So they had this huge airport, but it was decrepit, and it was basically had been forgotten. And overnight the town's population doubled. All of a sudden, there were like almost 4,000 new people that had to be taken care of. And it's about the story of that. It's about how people dealt with uh, terror and confusion and uh, stress and, you know, all these strangers in their midst all of a sudden from all different parts of the world, different cultures, different languages, and basically about common decency, about how people just, just basically rolled up their sleeves. Right. And uh, and got got over their shit and got to work and it's, so it's very it's very moving and very timely really I think one of the reasons it's so successful is that it's kind of necessary we're in a time where people are being kind of crummy to each other and kind of judgy and it's about like a really short period where people were really forced to overcome that and just do what was right in front of them and just, just see each other's essential humanity. Um, and, uh, and didn't and I, a lot of them open up their homes and stuff to people? Yeah. Yeah. I remember mm-hmm. seeing stories about that on the news and how yeah. this little town just welcomed everybody with kind of open arms. Yeah. It's a, there was a, there's a documentary on, on it, probably on YouTube, but yeah, it's a fantastic story. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great show. Uh, they want to they want to open us again. I think they're selling tickets for the fall season, and hope, hopefully we will because it shouldn't be too hard. I mean, all they have to do really is get everybody back together again, do some rehearsals, and give the place a dusting because it's all there. And this is and this is in Toronto. Yes, the Royal Alex Theater in Toronto. Okay. And Hamilton will probably come back too. Hamilton is a tour, but it's the same situation. They're just they just want to pick it up where they left off. Uh-huh. And yeah. in the meantime, I've been. Uh, just to keep from going crazy, I had a couple of projects. I, I went home to my parents' place in the states and s- started a hemp farm. I uh, 
I followed you on your Facebook, and I, uh, yeah, I got to uh, see that <laughs> that experience. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know how they say farming is hard. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it, it's you know it's it's hard, but at least there's no money in it. <laughs> so just like just like being a musician. Yeah, but it's it's um. It was it was kind of rewarding in itself. It was an incredible experience. I think every I think every human should do that at least once in their life. It, for for a short period, it was my favorite place on that. They don't they don't call it an acre for nothing. Sometimes I would ache. <laughs> But for a short period of my life, it was my favorite place on earth, especially at dusk, like after it started flowering, because the smell was incredible. We're at in Indiana, were you? Stand there at sunset and just bathe in it. Yeah. We're at in Indiana, were you? Uh, northwest Indiana, near the Michigan border. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do it again because, like, well, for one for one thing, the price has kind of crashed. Um, and also it's really hard on my hands, but it was an amazing experience. And I've also been studying. I mean, I have a lot of deficiencies in uh, in my musicianship, basically in my musical knowledge. I never really studied formally, so uh, I've been learning. To, I've been teaching myself how to play jazz. Nice. And uh, I'm with with a with another friend of mine, Gino Del Sol. He suffered for me in Rock of Ages, and I've suffered for him in Absolute Journey, and we've we're pals. And he's actually been to Humber, which is a really good music school here. He actually knows how to do it. So we're getting together once a week, playing through some tunes. And we take tun turns hosting in each other's apartments. And, you know, whoever's hosting makes dinner. And what I'm hoping is that when the weather warms here, that the patios are going to open up. And probably what's going to happen, what's going to come back first as far as live music goes, is good, like acoustic duos, yeah. like acoustic solo, acoustic duo. Not you know unamplified like conversation level music people, yeah. I think as far as like packing together in a rock club and in, in in a sweaty rock club and screaming at each other, that's not going to come back for a while. So it, I think, I th I think the people that have like strong solo game, are gonna are gonna be working first, and also I'm really fascinated by this music. It's uh, it's it's like, it really is America's gift to the world and one of the, it's in one of the finest art forms. As far as improvisation goes, it's it might be the highest form of music. Wow. And doing a doing a gig like Night Ranger, where you're or Queen Ultimate Queen Celebration, where you're replicating iconic solos note for note, or doing the musical theater thing where where you're similarly circumscribed, like you have to play the book. Um just doing this for a while, just just doing a deep dive into it has been really um fascinating and necessary mm. it's something i'm neglected and it really improvisation really is a muscle and you have to work it if, or else it gets weak so yeah. it's 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 an area it's it's an area that i've been building up I, ultimately i'd like to be able to sit down sit in with a uh with a, like a little jazz trio in any lounge anywhere in the world and and be able to call a tune and play it you know even if we don't speak the same language i've always envied <laughs> when, whenever i've been on tour um like around the world i've always envied guys that have been able to do that so um but you know hopefully by the time we reopen i will i've got a pretty good repertoire now of about of about a dozen songs that i know really well and i'm singing too like i've got i've got a handle on um you know i've got frank in my wheelhouse and also chet baker uh i have a chet baker i have kind of like a chet baker thing um is i mean you can probably hear some of that on the album i i it was it was kind of there even before I knew it was there. It was it was almost like it was always there. I just uncovered it. Well, so that's fun. It's interesting for me. It's something I've never done. And, and you know, you got to keep moving. It's like uh, it's like what Woody Allen said about relationships. It's, it's like a shark. It's got to keep swimming. <laughs> and what we have here is a dead shark. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just saying. It's yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> So, uh, Andy, Brent, you guys got some uh, some questions before we sign off here? Now, I just want to say thank you very much for taking your time to spend with us three knuckleheads, you know. Well, I got, oh, I got a couple if you don't have it's been any. A hell of a, well, no, go ahead. It's just been a hell of an right. education. I love hearing the stories. 
Yeah, I didn't ask mine when we got into the uh, right. whole grunge scene. Well, let me ask you a Brian May question, Tristan. Uh, <laughs> what sure. What is it about Brian May that set him apart from all the other guitarists in the 70s? Uh, well, he has a gigantic heart. And hair. And hair, yeah. <laughs> and sound. And I think his heart comes through in his, in his playing and in his sound. He's got a, a really... He's, I really can't say enough about the guy. He's the total package. Like, um, he's, you know, he's artistic and, um, and scientific. Like he made his own guitar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He did his own mods on his, on his amp. He like, he created his whole thing, his, his own thing. And he's, uh, yeah, he's an original. And there's a, and hopefully you remember the story. I read this online and I, it kind of gave me a smile uh, if I if I say the word Axe FX2, do you know what I'm talking about? Axe FX2, yeah. You, do you know what story I'd be referencing? Yeah, actually, um, I I I wanted to get I'd wanted to get one for a while because I'd been using them in musical theater, but I'd never I, I never had a gig that was big enough to really get their attention. So I got the Queen Extravaganza gig. So I figured this you know th- this will get their attention. So I rang them up. And, you know, they got excited and they sent me one. I had always wanted to replicate the stacked harmonies on uh, on the Queen recordings. I mean, like, really do it, like, do it properly. Mm-hmm. And I did. I've, I've, we were already, we were, we were rehearsing, uh, we had two weeks of rehearsal, like eight hours a day. And I would actually stay after hours and work with this thing. And I finally had it, I had it down to a T. And I demoed it for for Roger, and uh, I had like um, I had like all the intervals controlled from the pedal. I mean, it just sounded exactly like the record. And Roger was Roger said something like, "That's wonderful, Tristan. Justine, get them on the phone immediately and order." You know, it's, it's it it was uh, he, he he sent he sent his um his assistant to order two. So I was like, "Oh, okay, that's great," you know, because that had been a goal of mine for some time to, to really, to really nail this thing. And I came into work the next day. Justine came to me and said, "Might I have a word with you?" And I was like, "Uh oh, what what happened? What I do?" You know, that's never good. Rogers had a change of heart. Uh, it seems that it was so good that it made it made us look like we were miming to a track. Wow. So, um, basically, base, basically the tour manager came to me and said, get rid of this thing. Oh. So I had to call, I had to call him up. I had to call up Fractal and go, I can't use it. It's too good. <laughs> <laughs> ah. And when we're, when we got to, um, we got to LA and we were rehearsing for American Idol, I mentioned it to Brian and he said, well, I'm not too fussed about it. I mean, I just play the top note of the stack and the audience hears the rest anyway. What I wanted to say was, I'm, I, I couldn't say this to him, but it was like, but that's because you're Brian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can do that. And I just, I just, um, I just had to suck it down. And to be fair, he didn't want us staring at our feet. He wanted us running around and, yeah. and, uh, and acting out like the more, like, like the more of a show we put on, the more they liked it. I couldn't be too flamboyant. So if I'd been if I'd been staring at my my feet the whole time and working pedals, um, mm. you wouldn't have liked it. But he wanted he wanted big he wanted to be like Queen with big loud amps on stage. And uh, also we had two guitar players. So between me and and young Brian Gresh, you know we got we got pretty close. Also to be fair with the recorded sounds, you know you're not listening to a record. You're listening to a band in a big room. It's a different animal. You know, with the recording stuff, there's a lot of detail with um, precise, you know, miking techniques like mic phase and stuff like that. That all contributes to the character of the recording. All that stuff is lost in a big room. Mm-hmm. So it would have been, you know, it, it would have, it would have, it, you know, he was right. It was pointless needle dicking. I just read that and I just liked the, you know, it was so, you had to basically call the company and say, hey, uh, your product works too good. I, uh, yeah. I can't use it, but... uh I Chris, use it with Queen, I use it with Ultimate Queen Celebration. It's right here. I have to give a shout out uh, to Fractal. This is my Axe Eight, 
This is wow. what I bring with me on fly gigs. And um, it, it's everything in the kitchen sink. I actually get a lot of um, not only the guitar sound, but I also get a lot of the tape effects that they use in the studio. Um, and it's it's all it's all 100 percent under my control. And I love it. Every friend of house guy has thanked me uh, for making their life easier. There's no uh, there, there's there's no there's no big up on on stage fighting uh, fighting Mark's voice. Uh, you know the stereo imaging is fantastic. There's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't be able to do with an amp that I that I that I do with that. I also have to give a shout out to uh, to Godan. Like I mentioned about this guitar, uh, it's a Canadian company, and uh, that's just one of the good things about them. And they make everything that I could possibly need. There's uh, They've they've got uh, they've got classical steel string um, like uh, here's like an arch top it's like a jazz box uh, and there's this other thing here there's only five of them in the room there's another there's another there's another five of them oh that's here. cool looking <laughs> yeah this is a fretless instrument how thin oh, that is this is a fretless instrument it's called the glisten tar this is my go to for Middle Eastern sounding stuff. It's a fret. It's it's actually a fretless. Um, wow. There's a steel string over there. They make anything that I could possibly want, and they're a Canadian company, and uh, the quality is equal to any of the big American brands, and uh, they've, they've been really they've been really good to me. So, I want to be sure to give them a shout out. Um, they're a great company. They take care of me. Well, definitely, I uh, will. Th- uh, throw in their link when you uh when we put in your social media stuff as well uh yeah tristan thank you for uh sitting in with us uh uh definitely if you're out there listen listening when the uh when the when the pandemic ends get out there uh track down tristan whether he's doing the musical theater or doing the queen stuff uh i will post the as waters uh stuff out there for you as well uh tristan on behalf of brent and andrew and myself uh thank you for coming on my friend guys thanks so much for having me yeah thank you so much thank you you as waters engulf us we reach for a star I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. Take me, take me home. All right, how was that? A great, another great interview from Josh and us with the great Tristan Avakian. Um, I just want to say to everybody, uh, thanks for watching. You can check us out. The first place you want to go is the Facebook page. That's uh, Night Ranger Fans in Motion Podcast and Tribute page. That's the best place to find us. Uh, Josh, we are on Instagram now, right? Is it Fans in Motion? Yeah, just go to Instagram. I don't remember to tag it. I don't know. Fans in Motion, either do I. Uh, All right. And, uh, but, yeah, you'll find us there. Just do a little bit of searching. And if you're already watching this, you know we're on YouTube. But if you're listening, the best place to catch us is on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, hit subscribe and leave some comments for us. We appreciate it. And then you can also find us on um, all of your podcatchers that are out there, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Audio Mac, Pandora, Amazon, all of those. Hit subscribe. Leave a comment. We really appreciate it. Leave a review if you can even do that on any of those formats. I don't know which ones you're all using. Thanks again to the, uh, the amazing Tristan Avakian for the great interview. And thank you for watching and listening. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> I just let it sit there. <laughs> I, I started laughing. <laughs> um, yeah, another great interview with Tristan Vaki and Josh and us. <laughs> well, because Josh does it most of the struck, interviewing. It just struck me funny. Well, I just like how he's like, you know, going through the spiel and then just like, not. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, if you're still listening, as I've said before, you've got bigger issues than us. So on that note. uh, Oh, we're still recording? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, He's going to edit. Am I? 
Uh, oh, it's beautiful. Here, I'll, friends. Here, I'll, uh, I'll do it. And, some friends. And Andy's, uh, hey, we're, uh, bye. <laughs> then we're done. Brett, take us out. Fans of motion, we love you. Thank you. Bag and transvestites. And nothing and no one can make it demean us. I was pulling and pulling to keep it from snapping. Now I'm going to let go and find out what happens. Sometimes you just have to start where you are. As waters engulf us, we reach for a star.